Um, but just to introduce our first our first panelist, um, Agadem is a musician, cultural ambassador, educator, volunteer, and activist for cultural inclusivity and cross-cultural understanding through music. She initiated the Dumber Academy project where she shares Kazakh music and cultural content on social media to raise awareness of this underrepresented region. Agadem also teaches Dumbra classes and recently formed the first virtual Dumbra ensemble, which received recognition and was featured on major news websites. So very impressive. Thank you so much for joining us today. So sorry. Thank again. you for inviting. No, it's okay. <laughs> um, so yeah, while I'm waiting on the presentation, if you want to maybe just share a little bit about yourself, um, kind of how you started sure. it. Yeah, yeah. Both, Is... with your love for music. Mm -hmm. Well, as uh, you said, I'm a musician and um, I play the dombra and I play the guitar and I sing a little and I try to promote our culture through music at different events, in different countries. When I was also back in the U.S. studying, I also performed uh, there and uh, talked about Central Asia and the music. And um, you you folks probably know that it's a little uh, misunderstood region sometimes or underrepresented. Um, and whenever I say that I'm from Kazakhstan, not many people know about the country or have, a, have some stereotypes, uh, not very good ones, <laughs> not true. Um, so I think uh, sharing music and especially traditional one with the culture um, just promotes uh, cross-cultural understanding in some way. And uh, in my work, I try to do that. There are a lot of people who just happen to uh, see, um, like watch a video of a performance of uh, their, like the traditional music of Central Asia in general. And then um, they get curious and then they start to research and then they discover about the region and um, that <laughs> we are not as um, like bad as they think we are, <laughs> if, if you know what I mean. But um, yeah, so um, I think uh, with music, people can learn um, about other nationalities. It's like a first, um, like a gateway to just learn about the world as well. And then they get to know, um, like they, they get to connect with the music uh, firsthand. So I think that's also um, very important. Um, yeah, and I actually wanted to show the presentation because I have uh, cute pictures <laughs> of my students, how their journey, it's a really, um, so. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. I, I just got your presentation so I can share it now. Um, and mm -hmm. then, yeah. Well, this instrument is um, like a traditional instrument of Kazakhstan, but also it's um, like the um, ancestor, I would say, of other instruments in Central Asia as well. So um, I think um, like Turkey loves this instrument, Mongolia. Um, there are different variations of it, and each country has its own kind of version of it. Um, but I think it's still like they just love the sound as well. Um, personally, I've been playing it since I was like eight years old, um, and I just love the sound and the history and um, like what. Whenever you play a piece, especially a traditional piece, it has a deep meaning, um, some sort of history behind it. So you can get to know, like get a peek of what uh, people back then um, like used to think or feel or experienced a certain, I don't know, um, uh, events. So, yeah. Um, if if the presentation is ready, if if not, maybe I'll try to share myself. Oh, there it is. Maybe to the next one. Yep, to the next. Yes, this one. So what you see is a 
two string instrument that I play. And um, as I said, it has a long history and it's passed down through generations. Um, and um, it transmits cultural traditions, um, history and values. As I said, uh, each piece contains some sort of um, very, um, not always, but sometimes culturally important, historically important uh, events. Uh, the next one, please. Uh, and it has a unique sound. And um, as I said, many people love it. It's um, It has only two strings that are made of nylon, but still you, you can play so many things on it. Like you can play very fast or slow. You can play classical music. You can play modern music as well. It's just, um, um, it's just also a nice instrument to learn because it's kind of easier than <laughs> others because it has just two strings, uh, but still many uh, possibilities. And um, next one. Uh, oh yeah, and also storytelling. That I love that, um, again, uh, when you play it, you just tell a story and uh, the unique compositions. Um, in Kazakh, it's called Ki. When you play a key, it's um, really, you feel so much, like it's very, very vivid. So it can conveys also a wide range of emotions from joy to sadness. And um, again, um, it just means a lot to Kazakh people. And there's even a saying that a real Kazakh is a Dombra. Uh, and it's just um, uh, an integral part of our cultural identity. And um, it's also people, uh, there's a saying that every Kazakh household uh, has to have a Dombra <laughs> at their house. Uh, next one. Uh, yes, and it also acts as a unifying force. So whenever there's like a celebration, a traditional uh, event, um, ceremonies, uh, there's always a Dombra and just it raises our spirit. And um, it, when I wish I could play uh, a key that fast today, but I think there's like some technical issues. Um, but I can play something slow just so you have an idea of how it sounds. Um, here's my instrument. Uh, let me hold on. Okay. Um, I hope you can see me and hear. I, I can try to play faster and then you can tell me if it's like um, you can if you can hear it or not. No, you don't hear it. Oh, I don't. Oh, that's so sad. OK, uh, well, what about this? Yes. It's going in and out. Like sometimes when you were playing slowly, we could hear it, but I think the faster you get, the less you can hear it. Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> it's, it's beautiful though. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's not. But, um, you can just maybe trust me <laughs> about it. <laughs> um, uh, okay, let's let's move on to the next section. Um, yes. Uh, so I uh, think music can be a way to unite people of different backgrounds and cultures. Um, as I said, it can be a first step to cultural exploration. Um, and many people say music is a universal language, even if you don't understand it completely you can just feel it and then uh, also it serves as a initial gateway as i said to people to explore about other cultures for example when i see uh, traditional music of uh, africa japan indonesia uh, i get very curious and then i start to research so it's just a nice way to like introduce people to the world uh, next one please and yes, here, uh, it's uh, my student from New Zealand. And you can see that 
he is holding the Dombra. So it's such an incredible journey for him so, because he is, I think, uh, one of the only or few people who plays it uh, there. And then um, he gets invited to cultural celebrations like this here. I think it was Nauras or something different. But so he gets invited and he gets to play and experience the culture firsthand. He um, always texts me, oh, I learned about this tradition. Oh, I learned this. Oh, that's so interesting. That's so different. Like he gets to expand his worldview. And also like it's a both way exchange of culture because uh, he gets to learn. And then the others here, you can see, uh, I think, uh, two Kazakh women. And then, um, yeah, so they just exchange cultures like that. And uh, it breaks stereotypes. So um, again, there's like also about Kazakhstan, a very popular thing with like the Borat movie, I think. Uh, but uh, it's, uh, I think you guys know it's not accurate, <laughs> but it's even, it was filmed in Romania, but anyway. Uh, so uh, it's just, people have this weird misconception of how we even live. Uh, some people think we don't have cities, for example. They think we just still live in yurts and don't have cars or something like that. So, which is not true. Uh, so yeah, it's just a good way to break stereotypes because they Google it. And uh, next slide, please. Uh, here, for example, this uh, woman, she's from Switzerland and she came all the way to Kazakhstan from Switzerland because she so loved the culture and the music and she experienced the cultural um, traditions like the um, marriage celebrations ceremonies of like other kinds and she also performed so <laughs> it was fascinating and again um, especially I noticed many people from Switzerland they think that uh, they, they feel very connected to our culture um, I think they say that uh, the richness of the, the culture in Central Asia in general is like amazing and then they just want to experience it and when they learn it so uh, they started to just learn the instrument and after that um, they just fell in love with the culture and everything and some people just actually come here and visit us uh, for example she did and recently my student from the U.S. came to Kazakhstan to uh, experience all of that and firsthand next slide please so it serves like a cultural bridging and uh, building a global community with my work uh, you can see a lot of countries it's 11 students from eight different countries five continents um, the youngest participant is 14 years old the oldest is 63 um, so yeah it's just like so amazing how we just connected despite all of our differences um, just connect, connecting with music. And um, you can see some of the, for example, the oldest participant, he actually uh, created, uh, made an album with like Mongolian and Kazakh instruments. And then he got popular recently. Um, he, in Kazakhstan, like his music got many, um, like got recognition. Um, also the other students, they share what they learned back home. For example, uh, the first woman there uh, from Germany, she is a teacher and she had a, actually a class, uh, a lesson, a master class about Kazakhstan and the Dombra. And she introduced it to the kids and uh, she actually played it also. So I think that's amazing. And it just creates a sense of community. And it's also not only about one culture it's just uh, the exchange so i love to learn uh, about other cultures other uh, music of different nations right and it just feels um like we're like we are just one species right humanity and uh, i think we just need to appreciate our differences and because i think it's just um a diversity of human expression and if we accept and learn to appreciate um, uh, also, as I said, music is a good way to do that. I think it's um, just amazing. <laughs> it uh, unites us and promotes peace and cross-cultural understanding. Um, yeah, so if you have any questions, I'm so sad I couldn't play for you today. Uh, I have no idea why. Um, 
um yeah so the next slide is just uh yeah the end if you guys are interested you can follow us on social media and actually listen to the instrument <laughs> uh, we have videos there so i think that's it yeah that can be it so yeah thank you so again. much yeah, yeah if you have any questions yeah, we actually, we're going to have to um, move the Q&A to, to the end so we can get started with the other panelists. But thank you so much. Uh -huh. really appreciate yeah, you joining thank us. you. Um, and now I'm going to bring some of my other um, Macaulay Honors colleagues, um, Zarin and Ina, to to moderate the next the next panelist, who is going to be Agadim Kapar. So if you guys want to hop in. All right. Hi, everybody. Um, so to so to kick off our um, artist panel and curator panel, we'd like to welcome Agarim Kapar. Uh, she is an interdependent curator, interdisciplinary researcher, and uh, eco art activist who has been a driving force for contemporary art in Central Asia. In 2015, she founded Artcom Platform a Central Asian community-based organization, and is currently curating Step Space, show showcasing contemporary art and culture of Central Asia. Um, Agadim led environmental initiatives for lake ecosystems in 2020. Her notable works are Remembering, uh, Dialogues of Memories, Honoring Survivors and Victims of the 20th Century Political Repressions, and Time in Astana, After Future, an Urban Art Research Initiative. Please welcome Aigirim Kapar. Thank you. And what should I say? <laughs> Is there some questions or what? Well, so this is your space to um, share uh, what you feel like Central Asia, your influence, whatever you want to dis discuss. Um, we do like have questions, but they're like at the back of the panel. Okay. Um, so I'm for now for like right now I'm sitting in the place of the ethnomuseologist of uh, Saida Yeramanova, and uh, she's like working more than fifteen years to. Um, like a previous speaker, I Agirim also, she mentioned about the key of the Kazakh tra oral tradition. And uh, we just like uh, one half an hour discuss about her practices entire for these 15 years, um, mm -hmm. how to include this key uh, as a part of the UNESCO heritage, as an un un untangible um, heritage. Yeah. And this is also uh, for me, uh, kind of a dialogue with the Igrim. Yeah, and um, mm, uh, my practice based in uh, practice, and I'm a, I'm a curator, and I am, now I'm involved in the project. Uh, it's actually not the project, but it's like initiative, Balkhash uh, Kakamkor, Care for Balkhash, which is... Um, uh, 14 largest lake in the world and uh, the ecosystem uh, of the Balkhash Lake Basin is in uh, water crisis and also upcoming climate crisis in next um, uh, seven years this lake could disappear uh, as the same scenario of the Aral Sea um which is um, as you may know because it was like kind of um a famous um um catastrophe in the world about the Ralsi, even the, the DiCaprio supported um and are still supporting um Aralsi catastrophe uh to resolve the issues of the environment and the people and community but uh, the problem is that the same the same scenario now is going on in Central Asia in Kazakhstan, especially, and um, we still are 
um under the mainstream news i and but we are working now with the uh, Ministry of Water Resources of Kazakhstan and with uh, and Ministry of Ecology of Kazakhstan, and we are as in a grassroots initiative from Artcom platform, which uh, I'm from Artcom platform, which is a community based contemporary art and public engagement platform, and our mission is um, take care about art, culture, and environmental and climate justice uh, for the. Um, Mm, sustainable futures of Central Asia because Central Asia is not homogenic some place a space or object for, for some of the researchers or people yeah as an object for the research and we are like a, a people from Central Asia and this panel we are also talking about the futures about uh, Central Asia futures as in uh, uh Central Asians as also Central Asian diaspora because you can live from Central Asia but Central Asia cannot live uh, you yeah and thank you so much for inviting us to talk and to have a dialogue and uh, these uh, possibilities to share our thoughts and uh, I just like this is like a, for me it's like a performance I, I didn't uh, prepare anything as special but I can share about what I did today right so and today I met with the ex uh, former uh, minister of uh, water irrigation and he was the ex minister of uh, water irrigation during the Soviet Union time and it's uh, was our second meeting and he is a uh, 90 years old and his name is uh, uh, yeah and I was a literally like surprised that he's Kazakh speaking person because actually it wasn't like a, a, a possible to survive during the Soviet Union if you are Kazakh speaking person and uh, when we me and um, our team at Artcom platform, like I Gerem Plobai, Karlagash Ahmedbek, Antonina Van Lee, Rakmaral Bulat, and we are working and caring about Balhash for like you know, every day. Yeah. But today he said, like, oh, you know, you should think about Balhash Lake like every hour. And it was like, oh my God, what I should do else? Because, and um, this is also uh, another another um, topic about, it's like a, a Balhash Lake. It's a representative uh, position of Central Asia between China and Russia. And the interest of Russia and China also uh, met in a meeting in Balhash. And because this transboundary basin, yeah, and this, and uh, for example, uh, Kazakhstan and China, they are talking about, um, they have this long discussion for almost 20 years about this transboundary basin. How many waters should come to the Ile River and the Ile River supplies 80% of the waters to this Balhash Sea, and you can Google it. You can find on the map, please do it. This is like uh, my uh, hope that you will do it because you should know about the 14 largest uh, lake in the world. And this is the biggest um, uh, basin ecosystem in the world. And th there, there is some dangers, like in 20 years, this lake could disappear as the same scenario as the Aral Sea. And this will definitely impact all of us, yeah? Because this, uh, we are uh, living, unfortunately, in this um, uh, climate change epoch and um, with disappearance of the Balhash Lake, uh, we, we will all around the world will impacted by that. And um, and also there is some hope that uh, it's also important for especially for the Central Asia futures. It's um, transgenerational memory, and I'm really glad that we are uh, like connected with the Kipchak who are caring for the Balhash Lake 
last 40 years. And also another our mentor is uh, Bulat Isekin. And he's um, working uh, yeah, on the Balhash issues like more than 20 years. And what I can hear from this, like both men, and we are all like uh, uh, girls, and what I can hear from them, that they are so happy that someone appear around them. That, so, okay, we are not alone now. Yeah, even like this, you know, like big man, you know, with this ex-ministers, I don't know, like uh, experts of everything. And we are as an activist and grassroots initiatives now shaking the uh, levels. And I hope, not I hope like we are already uh, agreed that next year it was our it was our initiative that next year we will organize the international uh, water uh, water uh, environment and climate forum Balhash 2024 and we will also organize the exhibition and we will talk and and discuss about the futures of the Balhash lake as a part of the central asian futures and uh, because the water issues and water crisis in central asia it's the most important um, question for now and um yeah and i i don't know i have this idea that uh, as a whole as a whole people in the universe, we should unite uh, because of the climate crisis. It's not uh, just a, a kind of scary a picture of someone's futures. It's our reality for now. Yeah. And, uh, mm, and as, you know, like from this, from the water, to the war it's just like one step and i'm warning and i count my practices as an uh, art curator as a peace building practices um because for me it's not enough just to curate an exhibition and drinking some sparkling wine after that and sometimes when i'm tired and I'm like complaining to my colleagues, like, why we're doing this? I just want to create an exhibition, you know, just like walking around, you know, giving some interviews, I don't know, some photos and video shots from the something, from the openings. And uh, my uh, colleague, Akmarad, Akmaral Bulat, uh, she answered me, hey, you know, I give him like, uh, in next 10 years, you would love to uh, drink a wine, um, during the opening and uh, you need to you need to have this glass of wine glass of wine or glass of water for so why why you're doing this job yeah and i hope um uh, i hope also we already like uh, met um a ministry and the, the ministries of the cabinet of the, our ministries and i hope like um day after tomorrow we will continue this discussion and what i also Mm, uh, we, um, yeah, what uh, is also important for me that um, being an activist and artist and curator, uh, the creation, the space for dialogue with your governments, with your academists, grassroots initiatives, institutions, it's very, very important. And thank you so much for organizing this panel. Thank you. Thank I'm you. Here. Okay. Thank you so much, Igram. Um, so next up, uh, we're going to have uh, Ferenki Sispova, and she's actually here with us in person. Um, so we're so grateful to have her with us. She is an artist born in Samarkand, Uzbekistan, and immigrated to the U.S. in 2014. Her work explores the ideas of uh, home and inhabited spaces through painting. She holds a Bachelor's of Fine Arts from the Fashion Institute of Technology, and is currently working on her Master's of Fine Arts um, at Hunter College. 
Her work has been exhibited in numerous group shows in New York and even South Korea. Her work was recognized in Quora magazine, and most recently, she was the artist in residence at the Lion Residency in Austin, Texas. Please welcome Faraday's. Presentation. Okay, so she actually has a presentation, so I'm just going to open it up real quick. Can everyone, can you see this, the presentation? We can, we can see it, right? Okay. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. My name is Ferengis Yusupova. Thank you so much uh, for being here. And I wanted to thank Zora and her class for organizing this wonderful event. Um, I'm really excited to learn about each and one of the panelists' work and hopefully work together in the future. Okay. As already uh, mentioned, um, I am a visual artist, I'm a painter. Um, I'm actually based in Brook Brooklyn, New York, and I'm attending the event in person. Um, and in my work, um, I guess before I start talking about my work, I wanted to give a little bit of overview, overview of how I ended up where I am right now. I was born in Uzbekistan in Samarkand in 1997, and I lived there the first um, 16 years of my life. Um, our Samarkand, as you know, is a historic city. So I was surrounded with beautiful architecture from all the way to 14th century. Um, I, we would take class trips to Registan Square. So I grew up with a lot of history and I was, uh, and all that, I, I didn't know that at the time, but all of that kind of ends up informing the work. Um, in 2014, when I was uh, 16 years old, uh, my family and I immigrated to uh, Brooklyn, New York, through the diversity uh, immigration visa process, also known as the green card lottery. And it was an interesting time as a 16 year old um, to completely be in a new environment. I wasn't, I was still learning about myself. And then here I was in a new, 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 different part of the world in Brooklyn. And I had to, again, define myself and uh, figure out who I am in relationship in relation to American culture. Um, so my family is actually half uh, Uzbek, half Tajik, and at home we speak Tajik. And um, the next image that I'm going to show um, is kind of, uh, I wanted to include this image in my presentation because I wanted to give an idea of what kind of environment I grew up when I was in Samarkand. This is from uh, Navruz Festival's um, celebration. Um, our school would participate in this uh, on, on 21st of March, there would be a big celebration of Navruz and every school would make these handmade craft items. And it was a big celebration of, of spring and beginning of the new year. And um, this is something that we would go with my mom. And I have been really interested lately in uh, women's craft and specifically my own familial, um, the, the environment that I grew up in. For example, my mom and my grandma's interest in craft. Um, my grandmother was a seamstress and she would make um, uh, ceremonial robes for burial called kaltacha. And um, it's a, it was a tradition that was passed on from generation to generation, but no, nobody in her, after her lineage picked up, none of her granddaughters wanted to pick it up. Um, and my mother, although she would never describe herself as, a, uh, as an artist, has always been creative. And she loved making um, different things with her hands, something like the image that I'm showing is something that, for example, my mom would also make as well, just uh, decorate um, pillowcases or decorate teacup um, warmers. So I grew up with this kind of uh, decorative um, craft objects in my, uh, in my childhood. 
And this brings me to my work now. So in my, um, this is an earlier work from 2017. I really became interested in textile and specifically Central Asian textile and nature and uh, combining those two in one space. So this project was exploring um, the imagery in textiles and how a lot of the time it would reference like the immediate surrounding, like the mountains, the flowers. And I wanted to combine that this kind of um, liminal space in on canvas. So some of the works show canvas on its own, some of them just textile and others combine both. And this kind of exploration can, I, led me to exploring more complex ideas of space, of home, what it means to be an immigrant, what it means to leave one place and live in a different environment. And I was creating these hybrid spaces that are neither here or there. And exploration continued with um, combining landscape and architecture. And I was trying to emulate a sense of home um, since I have not been back uh, and haven't back, haven't been back for the past ten years. I yearn for, I, I miss it. I yearn for it, and I'm trying to um, kind of quench that thirst through through painting, through creating these imagery. Um, and in 2021, I became really interested in uh, miniature paintings, um, specifically Indo-Persian miniature paintings, and how um, the miniature artists were able to combine pattern and this kind of really um, complicated space into this flat, compressed, um, perspectival space that's like kind of stacked on top of each other. So the next few paintings that I'll be showing are very much um, in conversation with these uh, works. I'm very much interested in constructed space as well. I make work on unstretched canvas and it started off as a practical solution because I wanted to save money and I wanted to work big, but I didn't want to invest in big stretcher bars. But through working on unstretched, um, unstretched works like this, I started noticing something quite interesting where the edges uh, would fray naturally and I would just unravel them slowly one by one and they began resembling tapestries and carpets that I grew up with. So this is another way again that I am connecting to where I'm from through my work. Sometimes I go back to doing stretched paintings but it really depends and sometimes the composition uh, composition kind of demands what it wants to be. Um, and I wanted to talk about this uh, recent research that I am still uh, working on, where I really became interested in these uh, screens. They're called mashrabiya screens and very um, common in Islamic architecture. And they allow light, uh, but still uh, give the viewer who's, give the person who's inside the privacy. So you can look without being seen. And I thought it was a very con conceptually an interesting topic in general, because um, in my work, I'm, I'm interested in domesticity and how um, these uh, screens allow women in particular to observe without being seen. And I'm interested in the way that pattern can function not only as a decorative motif, but also serve a purpose. This is um, just a um, installation or like just a work in progress uh, image of when I did the Lion Residency in Austin, Texas. And currently I'm in, um, this, so this brings us to now, um, I'm, I'm studying at Hunter College and getting my uh, master's degree. And this is a picture of my studio and I'm going through kind of a very blue period here. A lot of the work I'm making is blue and I'm thinking about my grandmother again who was making these uh, as I mentioned earlier uh, traditional burial robes who, who are also only blue it was kind of it's kind of a tradition that's dying now um, but when I lived in Samarkand uh, women during during the funeral were only allowed to wear blue and um, for reasons that I don't know 
fully yet, uh, Blue has become quite important in the studio nowadays. This is an example of a recent work that I'm working on, continuing to explore unstretched canvas, and also kind of shifting to uh, working on wood as well, and kind of looking at my life in New York and trying to bridge this uh, gap because this image was th this this is a painting that I did uh, from a photograph and I was walking around uh, Long Island City um, here in New York and I saw this pattern and really reminded me of home and I'm really interested in these moments when when um, certain places transcend um, a physical location and can evoke a sense of the other place I am kind of searching for home in in places that are maybe not home yet and this is again the picture of the studio currently at hunter and i just wanted to end with just a quick let me see oh i don't think i can play the video there was a video that i wanted to show but this is just an image of um um i just started exploring um uh using automated methods so this is uh this is a machine called Axidraw that can draw patterns for you. So I'm really excited about the possibilities of this tool. And I am being told that my time is over. And thank you so much. And I will uh, get let the moderators back in now. Thank you. Taking yeah. Uh, okay, wait, talk. Oh, it's on. Oh, yes. Yes, I'm not doing it. Hello, everybody. Um, I apologize in advance for my sore throat. I'm pretty sick. So we're going to be introducing the next Central Asian artist, Gerald Sheffield. He is an artist and educator based in Los Angeles, California. His works revolves around challenging American stereotypes of non-Western countries. But before all this, he had an interesting career in military um, in the United States Army, where he worked as a visual communications and public affairs specialist in various countries. He was also uh, nominated to be a recent Fulbright recipient and now works in Uzbekistan to study Islamic architecture. Please welcome Gerald Sheffield. Please talk to us about the work you do and the art you make. Uh, th uh, thank you, thank you. Uh, can you all hear me? Yes. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Uh, just, I would just want to thank you all for organizing this and I mean, inviting me all to speak. I'll try to be as brief as possible. Uh, like you said, uh, I'm coming to here from a very complicated background. I was in the military. And so when I be when I got out of the military and became an artist, I wanted to go back to and study um, in the region. But the, the, the pretext of for me to come through um, to go to Uzbekistan um, actually came uh, after... Uh, President Trump issued the Muslim ban. And so uh, we, I had fellow classmates who felt uh, somewhat marginalized by that. And given my past uh, experience and the things that I was taught, that I was thinking of through in grad school, um, I was think, considering uh, studying and researching Muslim culture and identity on its own terms outside of the bounds of, of violence and, and war. And so I was really interested in engaging with um, uh, Muslim culture on its own terms. And so for me, it was this way of like uh, uh, approaching something and, and trying to uh, critique a way of representing um, non-Europeans that I felt is kind of consistent throughout um, a lot of uh, uh, a lot of uh, the diaspora of, of a lot of people who have been sort of uh, within the periphery of colonialism um, or Western colonialism. And so this was a way for me to kind of approach and engage with it in a very critical way. Um, I, I, I spent time in both Samarkand and um, Tashkent um, and just think looking at Feringas' work, uh, it just brought 
all these things that I was also um, visually seeing when I was there. And one of the projects that I did, um, I don't know if I can share it with you all. Um, we can share the video works, hold on. Okay, yeah, just the table project, I think is something that I feel resonates a lot with um, uh, Faranga's work. Uh, you can't really see the details, but um, a lot of it was based on, it was a collaboration between myself, my student, and one of, uh, and her, her, her dad, who was uh, a master wood maker. And so one of the things that I um, thought about, um, just kind of piggybacking off of Faringas's work was also, I came to this point of thinking about domesticity and like the substrate of like combining cultures. And my experience in Uzbekistan was one where um, I was invited to have tea and invited into many houses to have tea and have these discussions. Um, and in spite of like my own Western pedagogy of going into the archives and extracting information, actually most of my learning experience came from face-to-face uh, -face conversations over tea um, and having sort of these more intimate moments. Um, the symbols that are kind of hard to see in the in the in this table um, were kind of the the symbols that I saw on everything from uh, the Uzbek flag uh, to the size of buildings. Um, the the eight pointed star was something that resonated with me. Um, it was something that I always brought up. Like you know, I would ask my colleagues who worked at um, the Summer Con Technical Institute uh, where I was affiliated. You know, I would ask them about the abstraction and, you know, it was, there was really this interesting conversation that would come up about meaning and symbolism um, and then also just visual uh, representation. And so this piece here was gifted. Um, it was intended as a site specific installation um, and it was offered back to the university kind of as a, as a thank you for um, all the hospitality and the time that was spent with me. Um, but uh, again, this was an experience that fundamentally changed my practice and some of the things that I thought about um, even after this. Um, I made paintings during this time, but the paintings came actually after I got back. And so I was living in Uzbekistan in Samarkand um, and Tashkent uh, for, from February to November of 2019. Um, and then I came back and then a month and a half, we were on, on lockdown. And so I was in LA on lockdown and Basically, uh, a lot of the work I made after that was a reflection of just um, that experience. Um, but this in, 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 in general, I just want to give one little story about this and, and then I can open it up, uh, is that uh, when, I, when I arrived in Uzbekistan um, on the Fulbright, uh, we were matched with um, different organizations to secure housing and figure out like where we're going to be um, doing our research, which institution. And um, my connection, my contact from the embassy mentioned that there was uh, an Uzbek uh, guy who ran properties who wanted to speak with me. And basically he wanted to meet me and have this discussion. And so I'm um, not really knowing what I was getting into. Um, I decided, you know, I agreed to meet, meet him. And we sat down at a restaurant and, you know, he was asking me questions about where I was from. And I told him the U.S. and he was like, no, but really, where are you from? And so there was kind of this abrasiveness at first because I started to kind of go down this rabbit hole of trying to figure out how was, how was I going to explain like U.S. slavery um, and the concept that like I can't recoup something um, because of that incident. And he kind of nodded and basically he smiled and he said, you know, he said to me, he was like, look, I lived in New York for 10 years and five of those years I worked at a cafe and he was like the entire time I worked there um the African Americans were the only people who ever spoke to me so when I found out that an African American was going to come to my country and do research I wanted to make sure that I meet you in person um and just and make sure that you are taken care of in the same way that I felt taken care of and so that kind of like pretty much glossed or, or pretty much covered my entire time in Uzbekistan just having that hospitality, having that sort of intimate um, care. And it was something that fundamentally changed me and to think about like, you know, what was I doing with my practice, but also um, this space in Uzbekistan, um, the hospitality, the culture, and thinking through these aesthetics of care and love 
um, that's kind of how I arrived at uh, this piece here. Um, and so this, I consider kind of a thesis of my time there um, and it, a pretty significant um, uh, piece, uh, but it, it's similar to the way Farangas talks about um, her work and talk about sort of the symbols and domesticity. Uh, you know, I would love to know more about that, but um, yeah, um, thank you all for inviting me again. I know it's short and sweet, but love to just get into the conversation. Thank you so much, Gerald. Thank you for your talk. What's the next slide? Hang on. Thank you again. Um, so the next the next panelist is um, Professor Theodore Levin, um, who Marisol here is gonna is gonna take over. But um, Theodore Levin is a professor of music at Dartmouth College and a longtime student of music, expressive culture, and traditional spirituality in Central Asia, Asia and Siberia. He is the author of The Music of Central Asia and has produced recordings, curated concerts and festivals, and contributed to international art arts initiatives. During an extended leave of Dartmouth, Professor Levin served as the first executive director of the Silk Road Project founded by cellist Yo-Yo Ma. Now Marisol is going to ask a few questions. So Professor Levin, if you'd be able to hop on. Yeah, thank you. So um, our first question is, could you speak on how your experiences studying Central Asian music has shaped your approach to ethnomusicology? Sure. Um, first of all, thanks very much for inviting me and th these presentations have been just fascinating so glad to see people you know probably 50 years younger than me really being involved in in this culture this area um that's that's so culturally rich um i started my work in ethnomusicology uh, by getting a, a fellowship when i graduated from college back in 1973 50 years ago i graduated I got a travel fellowship awarded by the Thomas Watson Foundation that allowed me to spend a year um, pursuing an independent research project. There were only three conditions. I had to leave the United States for a year, not work and not go to school. Hard, right? Uh, but I, so I started, I knew I wanted to, to, to study music in different places. I started in Ireland and basically went overland to India by, by foot, by bus, by who knows what. And at the end of, the, of that trip, the part of the world that I really was most attracted to was Central Asia. It's hard to explain why. It wasn't only the music. It was the geography, the food, the people, the everything. Anyway, I went back there in 1977 um, on, a, on a Fulbright and also support from the IREX International Research and Exchanges Board, spent a year in Uzbekistan uh, uh, as a, uh, at the Tashkent Conservatory as a graduate student there, learning about Uzbek uh, classical music, which is called Shashmakam. And so really my whole experience of of be doing ethnomusicology which is the study of music in its cultural context uh wherever that may be uh it was shaped by my experience in uzbekistan uh in those years later i went to tuva in siberia where they do throat singing i was the first american to be allowed to go there to study the music record the music and i've i've written about it and put out records, et cetera. But those, those experiences and particularly the colleagues that I came to know in Central Asia in those years are still my close friends. And our dialogues and conversations over the years have, have guided me and, and shaped the way that I approach uh, studying music, writing about music, presenting, producing music, and so on. Lovely, thank you. Okay, so our next question is, how do you think that Central Asian music plays a role in preserving the culture of the region? Well, the, the, the music is the culture, of course. It's, it's part of the expressive culture. Uh, you know, anthropologists talk about culture, obviously, in a million different ways. But the notion of expressive culture as, as one part of that 
uh, say, is contrasted from material culture, uh, which is objects, uh, spiritual culture, which is beliefs. And they're all linked, of course. But uh, music is... I, what I what I find really interesting, and in, in listening to these presentations just underscores this, the, the the power of tradition in Central Asia uh, as a as a kind of generative force uh, and inspiration for contemporary art for the avant garde. So many young artists, visual artists, musicians, filmmakers are drawing on the past on tradition to make contemporary work. That's true in the visual arts, painting. Uh, my good friend, Saudat Ismailova, uh, an Uzbek filmmaker and visual artist who's in fact in, in New York now having a screening of some of her films tomorrow night in Brooklyn at Eflux. Saudat is a wonderful example of that. She's had work in the Venice Biennale. Um, she directed a wonderful multimedia piece called Kirkkuz, 40 Girls, uh, that we premiered at BAM, Brooklyn Academy of Music, a couple of years ago. If anyone's interested, in fact, in seeing Kirkuz, I'm just going to put the a video of it in the chat. Uh, it's a wonderful production, 80-minute uh, production that, uh, you know, I produced it uh, with the Aga Khan Music program. There it is. It's it's in the chat if anyone wants to see it. There's no password. Uh Anyway, this is a, this Kirkuz is a great example of how, you know, Saudat was interested in the epic Kirkuz, 40 Girls, which is from Karlkopakstan. And, uh, you know, it, it, it tells a story of, 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 of sort of Amazons of the steppe, as we called them, these teenage girls who basically fought off uh, aggressors and, and created a, a, a kingdom of, of peace and, and justice. And she turned that into an avant-garde theater piece. Um, but the performers were all, you know, they were young women in their 20s who were virtuosic performers and singers on traditional instruments, dombras, hijaks, dutar, vocalists, uh, jetigan from Kazakhstan, etc. And th this kind of thing is repeated again and again, where you see young people, by, by which I mean people, you know, around your age, um, you know, learning about their traditions and using that as an inspiration for new work. And that's not true everywhere. I mean, I, I don't think, frankly, that's so true in the United States. Of course, there are young people, and I was one of them. You know, I learned to play the banjo as a teenager uh, and, and the fiddle. I got interested in Appalachian culture. But I, I didn't, you know, I still play the banjo, but I never created contemporary work out of it. I just played traditional music. So anyway, this link, the inspiration that Central Asian tradition offers to young artists, I think is remarkable. And maybe it has something to do with the veneration of, of tradition, the veneration of ancestors, um, uh, the, 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 the notion that elders... Uh, rather than just being kind of sidelined the way they often are in the United States and put in old folks' homes, the way they're really used as sources of wisdom, knowledge, tradition, and inspiration. And I, I think that's a wonderful thing about Central Asia. Sorry to cut you short. Um, we don't have much time, so we're going to have to move on to the next panelist. But thank you so much for joining us. And we really appreciate you talking about everything. Um, so I'm going to introduce Satora and and Jane, who's going to who are going to be talking about um, Central Asian poetry. So if you guys could just hop in. Hi everyone. Um, my name is Satora, and I have Jane with me. Um, so our first poet. She's actually here with us in person, and she has with her physical copies of her book, which if you guys are in person, you guys can check out in the back of the room. Um, so Sahar Muradi is the author of the collection Octobers, selected by Naomi Shihab Nye uh, for the 2022 Donald Hall Prize for po Poetry and a finalist for the National Poetry Series. She is author of the chapbooks Gates, Ask Hafiz, A Garden Beyond My Hand, and A Ritual in X Movements. She is a co-editor with C.L.I. Karzai um, of Emergency, Writing Afghan Lives, 
Beyond the Forever War, an anthology of writing from Afghanistan and its diaspora, and with our own professor, Zora Saeed, um, of one story, 30 stories, an anthology of contemporary Afghan American literature. Sahar, um, she lives in New York City, where she directs the arts education programs at City Lore and dearly believes in the bottom of the rice pot. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. <laughs> um, thank you, Sitara John. Thank you, Jane uh, John. Thank you, Zora John, and the whole class for organizing this incredible conference, this incredibly meaningful um, and necessary conference. Um, I'm just so privileged to be here to share, but also to learn and to connect. Um, I've just been riveted since arriving and it was also very cool to see Ted Levin. Hey Ted, <laughs> we know each other from another context. Um, so I'm going to read a few poems from October's. Um, I'm going to start with a poem um, that I've been reading a little bit recently. Um, it's called Words by Which to Tell Time and I was talking to my cousin Zainab about uh, when she was growing up, living through the Afghan civil war in Kabul, she had told me she would measure the distance of rockets from her home. Um, and she could tell by the sound how near or far, so how safe or not. And I was thinking in my distance, my geographic distance from that in the United States, in the diaspora, and as a writer, I would measure the war through language and through sound. And I read this also um, just thinking about the raining and the raining of violence of bombs at the moment in Gaza. Words by which to tell time. I wanna note one more thing, uh, sorry. The piece also speaks to um, one of the results of the 40 year continued war and then the US occupation of Afghanistan was that um, it resulted in 2 million widows in the country. <clears throat> Words by which to tell time. Soul, peace, a word that ends silently a word whose feet never touch the ground. Siu Ash Saul, 38 years, not unlike Siu Ashk Saul, 30 tears old. Bewa could be be without, wa and without and without her and her conjunction the coincidence of two heavenly bodies at the same celestial longitude bewa without her heavenly half two million bewa two million halves in heaven salah Weapon, so near soul, how one might use one for the other, as in drone, for lull. Bomb, a word that ends silently, a word whose feet never touch the ground, here. Bomb, a word with a tail, in another country, a tale that lands clearly, firmly, a sound that splits their mouths. Um, I'm gonna read a second poem. Um, I feel 
this is the place that I would like to share it. Um, I just feel so privileged to also be able to be here in person, although I'm in a separate room from the crowd. Um, but that also seems thematically appropriate in some way. Um, this is, um, I have two little ones, a five and two year old, and um, just imperfectly trying to raise them in my mother tongue, which is Farsi sometimes called Dedi, although I'm learning about the politics of referring to it as Dedi. So um, in this poem, I, that's what I call it. And the poem is called, How Do You Laugh in Dedi? How do you say car in Dedi? How do you say umbrella? She reaches my hip bone. When I gently tug on her golden curl, it goes boing, a coil, like ein, like rein. My hair has always been straight and black, and alif. It reaches my hip bone. In Samarkand, we went to see the tomb of Daniel. It is 18 meters long. They say it grows five centimeters each year. It is still growing. It's draped in green velvet with golden threaded ayahs from the Quran. Her hair is calligraphy I can't read. How do you laugh in Dedi? She asks with a straight face, not an alif face, her father's face. This makes me laugh and cry at once. We don't teach her Afrikaans except for Biltong, Lapi, Bayadanki. At his former university, there are protests over the language policy. Our language policy is to not teach the language of state violence and oppression, except we do. I came to this country at three, the age my daughter is now. In preschool, I cried inconsolably. They don't understand me. By fourth grade, I replied to my parents only in English. When my friend Ebony came over for the first time, I said, I'm sorry for the way my mother talks. I meant the calligraphy of her mouth. All those years, no one asked us why we were here in the first place. They asked us other petty things so that we would carry their shame instead. This country's language policy works like most of its violences, subtly, supremely, staunchly. By college, I wake up mute and unrooted. They don't understand me. I went to Berlin and asked a German to teach me my language, to show me photographs of her time in Kabul in the 60s. This made me laugh and cry at once. I copied her slides and said, Tashakar, with an alif face. At 24, I returned to Afghanistan with my father. At last, at first, two decades later, when I opened my mouth, they widened their eyes. My father's eyes said, I'm sorry for the way my daughter talks, except I do and continue to, sincerely, scantily, staunchly. By two, she surpasses her father's daddy. By three, she replies only in English. How do you say hegemony in daddy? This country's language policy is draped in green velvet. It is not mine to carry, nor hers. It's now rose. I'm late to plant the sabza. She calls it grass. It's still growing, seeds puckered and pushing through the dirt. She tugs on one of the tiny coils. Look, mama, a sea. I wake up to her joy, fluent and rooted. Yes, I say for calligraphy, for the golden threads of our mouths. Um, do I have time for one more? Two minutes? Okay. Two minutes. I'll just, um, I'll just end with this poem, maybe on the pleasure of language. Um, it's called A Language Entirely. She notices the shamal in the trees. We call it dancing. I wonder if I could teach her language entirely in metaphor. This is a leaf yawning to the ground. You have two starfish, right and left. The clouds are playing piano again. She already gets this, of the neighbor's umbrella on the balcony tilted, she says, how, asleep, folds her hands under her ear, head tilted. To not correct, to allow the pleasure of the construction of the gesture, 
how she distills. For giraffe, she runs her hand up her neck. For elephant, five fingers swing under her nose. Her economy is expansive. The same single syllable for multitudes. Ma for Madajan. Ma for Most for Marmite, for Cousin Mateen. We must train our ears to her tongue's subtleties. She builds by repetition, reinforces by rhyme. Soon, like enters the room. Sound to me like growling bear. Look to me like window. A wedge, approximate. So begins a life of separation. In February, she says plainly under our gasps, grass, trees, barf, like diamonds, stars, moon, and bed, like diamonds. To see one in another is to see as one another. We watch her eyes as much as her mouth. Mucher, she corrects me. I like ice cream, mucher. The robot lost its eye. No, the robot is winking. Because to say is to see the power of a tongue accelerating, revving repeatedly of teeth marking the earth. We listen with the hunger of old eyes. Thank you so much. I'm going to pass it on to my peers who I'm so excited to hear. <laughs> Thank you, Sahar John, for your beautiful poems. And, yeah. yeah, and also she brought her books with her, so they are available. So go check them out at the back of the room if you're in person. So next we have Hajar Husseini, who is a poet and translator. Husseini's first poetry collection is Disbound. Her titular poem is available through De Dallas, and her poetic statement is available through the Poetry Foundation. A finalist for the Mohabib Translation Prize, her translations of contemporary Afghan writers have been published or are forthcoming in Guernica, Annulet, Asymptote, and Los Angeles Review. An Iowa Writers Workshop graduate, she is a visiting assistant professor of English at Skidmore College. Thank you. Thank you, Zadar John, and thank you, for Zohra John, for organizing this. Uh, it's such a pleasure to be in part of this conference. I wanted to talk a little bit about the book, but knowing that we are running behind, I'm just going to delve into the poem. Uh, do you all hear me correct? Great. Um, so the poem is titled Disbound, and it means that the book, whether it's in the form of manuscript or printed, has lost its binding, and it should be distinguished from unbound, which means that the book was never bound. I'm awakened to an atrocious dream. My sister cuts her hand, an extreme amount of mist. I can't make out the image. The scene has taken place in the kitchen and as she walks into the living, the innocence of her one question hangs. What do you think? Per the word of mouth, the solicitude and the disfigured candidate proceeds. At any rate, secure that delicate passage. And eased, she asks if you could dear chill, if she could dear chill this to my house, where I sat on my bed, examining my past and future. Two weeks following the dream. A last province falls. A coward president renounces the country midair. The dream follows the fall of a last province. Midweek flees a coward. Two fellows renounce their bodies mid dream for a delicate passage, precedes the scene of fall. Extreme mist, an image 
I examine amounts to nothing. This June in the Bronx with my partner and his oldest friend, we watched one episode of Exterminate All the Brutes. Soon, the documents affixed themselves to the members of my family, haunting me in ways unbeknownst to my lover or the old friend. Why do my people submit to this treatment? Terror jackets, spit motherfucker, air striked, curse blood sewage. I am that lucky bird, frying pan park. The foundation two years before the takeover registers that four in 10 would leave given the opportunity. By opportunity, many possibly mean a dignified manner of conveyance. Dignity, an intriguing practice. To be off tarmac, a given dignity, a singular opportunity. For those whose command of a foreign language is found to be useful, to write requisition after requisition, Claims such as, my so-and-so deserves A and B, also uh, C. Hereby, I promise not causing you an injury. And for those whose eyes must behold heart-wrenching capture, plane after plane taking off the burial grounds of local leaving behind most concurrent misfortune. To inhale parallel particles in the air, my firstborn brother, whose healing depression surges across the heart's bottom, abandons Bomyan. Adio indigeneity. Our second sibling, whose eyes have taken on the task of his tongue, renders fear and welfare, welcomes like a shrine. Our third, a sportsman, whose information include not being on an evacuation list. Cornered in a crescent kick, he drives from a few neighborhood east to arrive in an apartment where the sisters live where in a daydream I have painted myself with an elongated arms stretching across the continents to reach Venice hand, I create this tenderness to call them with the spiritual prerequisite. I barely hear any fully formed thought. A babble vanquished, sometimes a child's cry. I try not to ask, what now? And then, that intangible item in and out of focus, hope, like a sign of change that everyone talks about, lives underground. It's not uncommon for it to persist or have little resistance to a flow of despair. I try to grasp. Is it a possibility to bring them? My patient question ciphers irregularly, like neutrality amassing only to blow up in anger. Despite the predictable tendencies, I'm sorry. For up until the last flight, I was worried about my persons. The plural scattered and in silence chanted God the greatest in support of an army whose bodies were left in 400 beds. The nemesis press releases, they cannot differentiate the dead's roots from its belonging. It's almost November, two and a half months of 2.0. My husband, whom I married earlier in that invasive August, 
mentions in passing, I didn't expect us to suffer this much, this early into our marriage. The world's wildest ideological practices on that infamous site of experimentation. I rehearsed the sum of all interferences and my own insignificance. My forms oppose irresponsible innovations. As a colleague described, they self-emerge and self-suffice. Bare and humbled by the bombardments, with no expectation of idiosyncratic declarations, this poem, 1400 words, plant the pledge, redo, redo. And even though I have stranded many architectures of you, always there lingers an outline of something I must get back to. When my father died, the constables were not poets. A cruel variant was traveling through the houses. We had no procession of mourners. The killer banned all trends of grieving. Outside, maps of the opponents were advancing. His gravestone on the long list of soon to be carved. If I ever go back, I'll find him lying next to my mother, nameless at last. I want to go back. My father has died. Their poets have traveled to the outer maps. Their killers have banned all trends of advancing. Constable's cruel variant fled from the country. A coward carved a gravestone for each house to grieve a long list of mourners who had no procession. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Haja John. Um, we're gonna move on now. Yeah, next we're going to have Aria. And just Aria, so you know, we want to finish this specific panel at two, so until two o'clock for you. What? Aria, I'm sorry. Okay, um, so I'm just gonna read your introduction. Aria Aber was born and raised in Germany and is currently based in Los Angeles, California. Her debut book, The Poetry Collection, Hard Damage, won the Prairie Schooner Book Prize in Poetry and a 2020 Whitting Award. Her poems are forthcoming or have appeared in The New Yorker, New Republic, The Yale Review and elsewhere. A graduate of the NYU MFA in creative writing, she holds awards and fellowships from Kundiman, the Wisconsin Institute of Creative Writing, and the Wallace Stegner Fellowship at Stanford University. Her first novel, Good Girl, is forthcoming from Hogarth and Bloomsbury in 2025 and will be translated into six languages. Um, hello, everyone. <laughs> It's so good to be here. Hold on, I need to like figure out my view. Is my camera on and everyone can hear me? Okay, good. It's so funny to see myself on camera because I was like off the entire time and apparently I didn't even look at myself in the mirror. I feel like I look very childish, but that's that's okay. Um, thank you for uh, having me. It's been very moving to listen to what everyone is working on and to listen to the poetry. I wish I was there in person. Um, and uh, it is a very different time zone where I am. I'm in LA right now, but I think maybe I'll just read one poem. Um, and if I have more time, I will read the other one too. Um, and I'll start with Notes from the Ruined City. On the mud spattered steps of cobbled blue mosque, a pomegranate half vibrates with worms. God has no clock, but the muezzin song, which veils the city's vascular glass and dilapidated buildings each fifth hour. It must. Evenings I rinse from my face, the city's dust, its fried oils. My eyelashes sweep, then blacken 
like battery grease, the handkerchief of time until I see you again. In the night markets, fruit clings to soft rain. Fish with eyes like milk warm the ice. I lost you. I lose you again. Before you left me, we held each other in the American hotel overlooking this landlocked relief, our bodies exuding summer, a halo of insects lighting up the balcony. Amid the ruins of the neighboring roof, one could see two children sleep like children on the white wood of a dismantled door. Um, okay, I guess I'll read the other poem quickly, um, just because I'm mentioning a friend whose name is also Parwana in, in this poem, so I think it connects nicely. <laughs> um, church. There was nowhere else to wait until the cinema opened. Too hot, even at dusk, in the Praise Christian Fellowship parking lot on Beverly with the blue and red neon cross. Parwana lowered the windows halfway. Potato tacos, September wind, and amusing dialogue about what our boyfriends did. My mind slid down towards youth and distilled tonic drinks, by which I mean you. That morning we sat by the canal after I had embarrassed myself at a party again. The sweat pits on the shirt you wore, your pale hands harvesting the label off the beer bottle. Picture the light stirring between the cars, a reddening of sky, indigo paint flaked off the metal fence. I can never get over the irreversibility of things you wrote in your suicide note. We were friends, and then on a platform in London, against the weather, anthracite, icy, desolate, I sent you off. Wind muzzled the park with a tree where you hanged yourself, we guessed, with a belt and some zip ties. No, it must have been morning. It must have been the end of something concrete and rapturous. There were paper receipts, a police report, a book for your baby niece, and some calls were prepared and then hung up on. This is church, you used to say, about the nights we spent tweaking at the kitchen table. We could be everywhere at once with language, voyaging, exotic voids, it moved me more than the film, I mean, the waiting in that parking lot. Parwana's ruby sweater, tinfoil glimmering on the desert scene, and then the cigarette. Um, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we'll have our next panelist come. Thank you so much to those panelists. Um, and thank you to, to Jane and Satora, that was so amazing. Um, the next panel is going to be on Central Asian film. So I'm gonna um, ask Ariana and Tisha to come and moderate this, this panel. So if you guys could just join me. Yes. Hello. So our panel is on contemporary Central Asian film. And to start us off, um, we have Anissa Sabiri, a London-based self-taught fil filmmaker from Tajikistan, focused on concepts of identity and memory and searching for an indigenous Central Asian language in cinema. So Anissa, thank you so much for joining us today. We're very happy to have you here. Um, if you could talk for a bit on what you're currently working on, as well as the process of creating work for a, a global audience while also staying true to the local cultural context, please. Thank you very much. I mean, first of all, I, would, I just want to say that 
Um, I've been listening to all the panelists and it was just incredibly inspiring. I'm so um, excited that we have all these amazing women um, and there were some men as well. Um, but it's just really important to hear all the female voices uh, so loud and strong. Um, and um, I've been um, searching for my voice as well as a Central Asian and woman. Um, both um, in Tajikistan and internationally. Um, and it's been quite a challenging process because first of all, um, I think as a Central Asian, as a Tajik and Central Asian, I was trying to find my place in my home. And then uh, when I went to study abroad um, to London um, and participated in a lot of initiatives, programs um, as an artist and filmmaker, um, I face sort of a, a different cha uh, challenge to find my place in um, a different country, in a different uh, framework, uh, trying to understand who am I and so on. Um, and this is actually uh, mainly my um, topic of reflection uh, in my art and my activism. What I do is to try to um, search for the indigenous film language and indigenous art language um, in my storytelling, which I think is something that uh, we haven't been discussing um, in, well, during the early post-Soviet time. And obviously we were not uh, touching this topic during the Soviet time because of the colonial history um, of Central Asia being part of Russia and um, Russian do domination. So um, the post-Soviet period sort of seems um, at an independent period and um, it looks like, well, there have been so many opportunities for us to speak about our national languages and national culture and so on. But in fact, we just uh, sort of fell into a, 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 next, a, a different post-colonial trap of um, still being an, under strong influences of um, former colonies and uh, under strong influences of the Western education if that uh, took place in the cases like mine. And um, I think this is quite an interesting challenge because um, we are used to, I mean, especially my generation and I'm 32 now, we used to hear uh, and know and learn about ourselves from people who were used to visit our countries or used to live in our countries, but not from that land. Uh, or those who um, are my parents' generation, they used to um, know about themselves from those who wrote this, our history. So right now what I'm doing is to try to unpack all these layers, uh, which are very, very complex. And uh, they're also part of our identity, of course, uh, which is, I think it's very important to not ignore. Um, and one of the projects films uh, that I'm working on now is a creative documentary called Generation. Uh, it's a hybrid genre documentary that explores the memories of the perestroika time, which is like for the end of 80s um, in Soviet Tajikistan and Uzbekistan, countries that share a lot of culture. Um, and culture and language and languages and uh, identities and so on. And of course, joint history. Um, and it explores these memories from the both decolonial and post-colonial perspective. And I'm trying to uh, incorporate in my documentary the methods of the indigenous storytelling of Central Asia, which um, I came across from sort of unpacking the story, the European storytelling that was, um, but that is hugely practiced in my country, um, and realizing that this is not the storytelling that that is indigenous. So, what is indigenous storytelling? Uh, and when I was asking myself um, this question by studying at the London Film School and like my some some of my practices, I excavated this. Um, I sort of looked back to the to the art of Central Asia, Persian art and Turkic art. And then I realized that, well, we actually always had storytelling that sort of was non-linear, was very symbolic and something like that Parajanov used to have, which is like anti-narrative, anti-government, anti-system. And why not to use this kind of storytelling? Is it, is it, isn't it 
uh, not something we could also practice in film. And I think uh, this is uh, like sort of like a Susani carpet um, design, which was also like the, the patterns we used, uh, domestic patterns as part of art, art making practices. Uh, was mentioned at the very beginning of the conference that uh, this is something we can be inspired by. And I think that uh, this sort of like nonlinear pattern based storytelling could be a really great uh, option for our filmmakers uh, to sort of go for um, non elite, non elitist, uh, very grassroots uh, way of making things because we don't really have budgets, we don't have governments supporting us, and definitely there is censorship. So, this, this is my pathway, and I'm really excited to start this sort of, you know, um, uh, route. And I have just realized it quite recently, um, maybe going to this point, coming to this point for a long time, but now I'm excited to explore it more, yeah. Thank you so much. Um, we really, um, I know Ari Ariana has watched their film Crying of Tanbur and Part of it, like one thing we were curious about is that link from Crying Up Tenbor to the sort of documentary film that you made with um, with an English musician of kind of exploring Tajik music. So like, what was the process of going from that to the documentary film? Well, I think, I mean, first of all, thank you so much for your interest in my art, my, uh, my previous works. Uh, I, to be honest, uh, I think that my, uh, well, both Crying of Tabor and The Rhythms of Lost Time were, yes, exactly the English musician that comes in exploring, uh, comes to explore the music and sort of to say, well, you know, guys, this music is interesting, you know, why don't you value it? Uh, I think these projects are very, they're very influenced and informed by the colonial sort of heritage of storytelling we have. First of all, the crying of Tanbur is very linear, it's quite costly, and the um, uh, it, it's like a very uh, classical arc of the character, you know, who needs to achieve some things, have a starting point and then achieve and then have challenges to, in the meantime. Um, and then the, which is a Euro absolutely classic European way of storytelling. And the rhythms of last time is yeah featuring the, uh, the like sort of the white Western person coming to value our culture. So uh, I'm really unhappy with these films because uh, these films are not what I sort of what I feel like is an honest storytelling of the region. And I'm very happy that I made them. Uh, I think they re represent my uh, pathway. But I'm interesting. It's I'm, I'm interested in something else because I think there is much um, more authentic way of making things there. Thank you so much for your time. Um, we'd like to move on to the next panelist. Her name is, um, sorry, just to get everything set up. Um, our next panelist is Aiganim Mukhamajan. She is a multimedia artist and director born in Shu, Kazakhstan, and her work explores the complexions of Kazakh society in social, economic, and cultural aspects. Her, there's also this focus on revival of language and traditional culture. Um, if you could introduce yourself, just talk about the work that you've been doing and also your short film, Alas, which is about this kind of endangered tiger species and how it relates to like endurance and survival and all that. Hi everyone. Um, first of all, thank you for inviting me and I'm really happy to be with you even if it's, if it's uh, 1 a.m. Uh, and I prepared uh, a little presentation uh, and I want to show it if, uh, if it's possible. So can you see it? <laughs> Yes, yes, we can see. Okay, um, so my name is Ayrana Mohamed Jan. I'm a multimedia artist and um, film director from uh, Shu. Uh, it's a small town in southern Kazakhstan, the region deeply rooted in tradition. And uh, my art is centered around my own image. So I am the main object of my art and main inspiration. I uh, work with photography, video, performance, installations, uh, memes, and much more. Uh, so uh, 
I explore such topics as uh, Kazakh language, Kazakh identity, uh, my identity as a Kazakh woman, uh, ecology, decolonization, and so on. Uh, so my, uh, oh my God, why it's impossible to, ah, okay. Uh, Alas is my uh, first uh, short film. Uh, it means fire in Turkic languages. And uh, the story is based on uh, extermination of the Turanian tigers, uh, which used to live in Shu, where I was born um, around a century ago. So, and their complete uh, disappearance. So this movie is about the last spirit of this tiger, uh, because uh, people and tigers could not uh, coexist. Uh, and the, for example, this work is also um, uh, shows how I work with the topic of ecology. It calls uh, Shu. And the uh, Shu River is the one of the longest rivers in Kazakhstan. And uh, now it's there is a big problem of shallowing of this river. So the shallowing of the rivers uh, is, pro is the problem not only of Kazakhstan, but also whole of Central Asia. Uh, and um, these two works uh, were shown uh, in Documenta 15 as a part of the moving image from Central Asia section by the Vra Collective. Um, also, Anissa's work uh, was also here. Um, uh, for example, this is how I work with political discourse. And I, uh, this video is about uh, breaking dishes. So in uh, according to the Slavic rituals, they break dishes for the luck. Uh, and I bought in Moscow some uh, propaganda plates with Putin's image and break them, uh, wishing the end of the Russian colonialism and imperialism. Uh, and uh, I think in my art, I want to show uh, my opinion, my position, political position. Mm. Also, I work with uh, esoteric rituals and uh, some hybrid uh, religious beliefs. In this uh, video, this is a parody of uh, TV fortune tellers. And I make a fake tarot reading for the next year, like Happy New Year is my like wish for you, <laughs> for people. Uh, this is my short film of this year. Uh, this is how I spent my one day. It's like a video diary or, or self-portrait. Um, so I just uh, capture some nuances of the Kazakh daily life. I walk the markets, I walk the uh, this healer session and just walk the streets and this is how I spent my one day uh, also um, so this is the uh, my debut full length documentary and now it's on the editing stage uh, it calls uh, it means like 30 days of thinking 40 days of celebration and it captures all the stages of Kazakh um, wedding weddings, uh, toys, like big celebrations. Uh, and I showed the wedding of my older brother. So it's from the preparation for this uh, big celebration and the whole uh, wedding. And this is how I work with my uh, like family relations and traditions. And the last, uh, my latest work is called What's in My Back. This is a parody for uh, Vogue videos, like uh, where celebrities so show what's in their bags. But uh, in my bag, there are some um, like cutting tools as a pink hammer or pink knife. It's a reflection for our disturbing reality where women should think uh, uh, what to wear, what to say, and uh, how to protect themselves. But in fact, uh, because violence uh, became the norm, and but in fact, we should not think uh, how to protect ourselves, but the law and the government should protect us. And th this this was the examples of um, uh, how I work with, for example, feminism. Uh, and uh, yes, that's all. I, I can send you the links of all these uh, uh, films and videos. You can contact me uh, on my Instagram or by email. Yes, this is uh, my introduction <laughs> part. So, yeah. Thank you so Thank much. You. <laughs> Beautiful. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So I just wanted to extend a question to both of you, um, whichever one that wants to go first. Um, so during your career specifically, what has been the most impactful moment you've experienced, if not during your career, during one of your projects or prior to the start of your career? So um, 
I guess to start off, Anissa, if you want to answer the question first. Thank you. I, could you please repeat the question? Um, I mean, just to clarify. Yeah, what exactly. sure. So I just meant, um, um, could you describe one of the more impactful moments, like more, I, want, I guess, important to maybe your life, your worldview, and you've experienced during your career, during one of your projects? Um, hmm. I mean, I actually, I think that the, because because probably the most uh, significant um, in my like recent career, uh, the most significant thing was the war in Ukraine um, because um, it created a lot of uh, sort of reshape of the uh, artistic and industrial scene in Central Asia. And I think we are, uh, well, actually, we've been um, yeah, talking a lot about it um, uh, with other peers that um, there is like a new wave of um, um, sort of not colonization, but um, the influence of the former colony. And uh, it's quite an interesting uh, landscape for us Central Asians to think about um, sort of the innocence of our art and the innocence of our industry and what each of us can do in this regard and how can we move forward by uh, preserving the um, maybe the, the, the this uh, sort of first roots of the in search for indigenous and authentic um, voice of Central Asia, which is quite challenging due to new initiatives, which just remo which just moved to, to the region and now trying to sort of succeed there and monopolize everything. So I think that's quite a, an interesting call and challenge for me uh, personally. And I think it also boosts my um, desire to sort of help peers and create this self, um, um, well, not, not even more like a peer support, a horizontal network um, ecosystem where we all could be just like one voice representing many, uh, but in a very transparent um, way. And I think each of us can benefit of, uh, from this. Uh, and I'm thinking a lot about it because it also impacts my storytelling, the way I, I'm thinking about my projects and how to make them in a more most ethical and impactful way for the region. Thank you so much. And um, if I could also extend the same question to um, uh, Aganem, please. So can you repeat this question again? Uh... Yes, no problem. So, um, I have it right. Oh, give me one second. <laughs> uh, what has been the most impactful or significant moment you've experienced during your career or during one of your projects? So now I am only at the beginning of my journey and career. I have only like one uh, fiction short film. And I think this is uh, this was the like uh, cool start because uh, uh, in this movie, our last movie, uh, there is no professional actors. Uh, we made it with uh, local people. Uh, for example, the main character is my brother, little brother, and my uh, parents were also like uh, including in this process. For example, my mom was like casting director. <laughs> so there's uh, no connection with art, but uh, this was like a really good experience to work with. Uh, my family and my even uh, relatives, uh, I don't know, and people, local people. So uh, for example, in Kazakh uh, film industry, I hate that a lot of uh, people from the big cities came to like villages and small towns and make some uh, film where a lot of self exotization for example, and they uh, show the local people as the savages or like use them uh, and with their like urban people uh, perspective. And uh, I think uh, my uh, film is like uh, how I see my people and how I want to show them. Like, uh, and this was the uh, cool moment for me and in, in my career, <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. And I also have another question that I would like to extend to both of you. Um, it relates to part of the earlier comment about reach, your art reaching a global audience. So as Central Asian artists and filmmakers, do you feel as if you're kind of 
pigeonholed into creating art specifically pertaining to a culture and showing that? Or is it like, like, have you faced any kind of pressure to conform when you're creating your art? Again, do you, would you like to start or do, would you like me to start? I want to think. <laughs> yeah, I think I think it's a great question because um, I mean, on one hand, there is like a, I mean, actually, to be honest, I think the industry demand in sort of exotic images of the region, and I feel it very strongly. And uh, on the other hand, it's like a question of um, whether. Well, it's a, it's a question of pride, yeah, to showcase your culture in the most, uh, um, most um, important and uh, profound way. Um, I, I think that in my art, I was always, um, it was always, it's, it's always been a question for me because um well, on one hand, I, I made this film about uh, rituals and traditions, and um, that's like, a, you know, art and culture is everywhere, um, authentic, I mean, I mean, local indigenous art. But on the other hand, it's, it's always really hard to find the balance of how to make it, to not self-exoticize this. Um, and I actually really love the way, for instance, how Aganim is doing that, because it's, um, is showcasing the the local patterns and local culture in the most uh, authentic way, I think, and most honest way. But there are also, of course, um, other ways to show that. Um, I think ask, ask, answering this question for myself, I would say uh, it shouldn't be about trying to be likable or... Um, trying to tell people what we are like and uh, sort of create the image that we don't know about, but to show even if it's just people wearing European clothes, that's fine if that's the norm normality of it on the street, for instance. Um, it shouldn't be anything that we want to showcase. It should just should be us in the most authentic way. Like I just, I just maybe add quickly that um, I had a discussion with one of the international, very famous international uh, festival programmer who said, well, you know, guys, we don't want your black and white films because that's like it's European, you know, stereotype. And I'm like, you know, you guys shouldn't tell us what kind of films we should make, you know, it's, but there is a demand in color like bright colors of Central Asia. So that's that kind of thing I, I, I want to, to say, we shouldn't make films for these kind of festivals only, but first of all, for for our artistry and what we are in order to say something. Thank you so much. And I can, if you have anything to add. Yes, I think uh, in the global film industry, especially in the European film industry, there is a trend for like Central Asian artists, but it's uh, only a trend for them. Uh, they uh, romanticize us or just demonize us. And I think this is not a trend for us. This is our life. And we want to also be represented and not the uh, exoticizing us. Yeah. So this is the uh, small addition. <laughs> Thank you so much for both of your comments. Yeah, and um, Ariana would just close it. Yeah, um, unfortunately we have to cut time because well, um, well time constraints of course, uh, but we would like to express a heartfelt thank you for taking the time to join us on this panel. And we really thank you for the incredible insights that you shared today. We wish you all the best in your endeavors and we hope that you enjoy the rest of the panel as well because there's much more in store. <laughs> and um, we'll be letting the next panelists take over from here. Hi guys, so we're just gonna jump uh, back for a little bit into the artist panel. <clears throat> yes. Hello. 
Hello, um, I'm going to introduce the next artist, Fayina Yunusova. <clears throat> She's an artist who is deeply involved in post-colonial studies within Central Asia, emphasizing the hybridity and fluidity of cultural identity. Yunusova's art practice is deeply rooted in her biographical background, having studied monumental painting in Russia and now contributing to the artistic landscape in Germany. Faina, I'm interested. Um, you mentioned before that um, you wanted to talk about artists' expectation and turbo capitalism. I'm also curious to know how you cultivated your aesthetic to grapple with these aforementioned issues. Please take over. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, yes, I'm a bit later because of the train. And I hope I could catch uh, some people there. So thank you uh, first for the inviting. Uh, for having me today and i also want to share um, my work uh, with you i uh, you see it yeah yeah perfect okay uh, so um yes um how you also mentioned it before my all uh, my actual artist practice is based completely on my biographical um situation i would explain because uh, uh, I was born in uh, Uzbekistan and grew up there. And when I was 18, I moved to Moscow uh, because uh, uh, I'm I'm from working class family, and uh, my family was very proud when I started to to study in Moscow because for them it was very important that um, the child from working <laughs> class family studied in the big city and you know like Moscow. And uh, but uh, when I'm thinking back and now I analyze why it was so important for my parents uh, because of this uh, colonial past and uh, and now we can talk about it. But if you um, when I talked uh, about it uh, just three years ago in Tashkent, it was a very very small group of people who could understand me uh, why I'm. Uh, calling that colonial past uh, because a lot of people thinking that Soviets that it was the best what happened in in Central Asia so uh, and when I moved there I was um, really surprised that I'm not uh, like a part of it uh, this uh, whole culture and I was surprised that I'm uh, black in Russia and that was I also experienced it uh, and this uh, part of the experience I take it with me now and now I'm working with that um, and when I was in my university it was monument a uh, very t traditional academic uh, um, art academy and um, after five, uh, five years, I was expelled uh, from the academy. I, and nobody knows exactly why. And um, and I think because of I'm starting to discuss a lot with my professors about why we doing that and why we're learning that. I was a bit. I wanted to change some. Uh, um, not the whole program, but what we learned. So I want to to have a bit more freedom, maybe. Um, that was, a, I think, the huge point. And at that time, I was uh, one uh, woman uh, from Uzbekistan who sta started there. And because a lot of people from Central Asia, to understand me, just in Moscow, they're working on the on very uh, bad paid jobs. And um, I was really lucky that my parents uh, uh, support me. And um, in that moment, when I was expelled, uh, my future was like, uh, I don't know what I have to do. And I, when I moved to Germany to, to continue my, um, my artistic journey, um, and uh, then I started here experimental um, Spartal concept. Uh, now I'm doing installations and also monumental painting also as a part of my work, for example, and the background that the, the work what I will show in Paris uh, on this Saturday. And um, now, uh, after this huge experience from Uzbekistan to central of colony uh, Moscow and then in Germany when I'm already st actually started to asking myself uh, what was it in Moscow or why I'm black in Moscow uh, or why uh, why people react uh, of me that or some and then I get a lot of questions in Germany like uh, why your uh, language is Russian I mean mother language and um, that's, I think that was the questions where I started to think about it. And uh, and uh, then I started to research uh, my own past, I would say. And uh, and after, like now I'm doing this research around five years on this post-colonial 
um, uh, topic. I think that is very important to state because uh, I started in before the war started in Ukraine, and um, I noticed now a lot of people starting to talk about it. That's very very uh, nice because um, in that moment for the war, I think it was it wasn't visible, uh, but. Um, but now, after this attention, when uh, also Central Asia get and people from Central Asia get, I experience a lot of expectations on the artists from the, I would explain at the like um, West uh, uh, market, and uh, uh, I meet a lot of people or the gallerists who expect uh, that I will produce uh, this typical traditional. Um, Central Asia stuff or exotic stuff, and that's uh, what I talk about when when we as artists now on this tour of capitalism because uh, we have to sell our identities to survive, and that was also the work um, um, that I did last year. Uh, it was also my uh, part of my diploma diploma work in university. Uh, that's a huge part of my life. Uh, it's about. Uh, um, marriage uh, and uh, she did it it's called like a lot of uh, a lot of things that are hidden there because she did it first she uh, finished university because i didn't finish university in russia and second is she did it that's because she get married and in that video um i also had experience as a youtuber in 2014 and here I'm um, asking and like Q&A and asking the question from my followers, uh, what I will do when I will get married. But in this video, I'm preparing myself for the marriage for to get a German visa. <laughs> so that's a huge uh, thing that we're also uh, challenging uh, people with uh, specific background or specific passports. Like uh, uh, in my case, Uzbek passport, it's not too easy to get a visa also in uh, Germany. And uh, the one way when people talk that, oh, just you get married and you get your visa. So that's uh, mm, the point where I found to talk about it with this irony and extremely um, exotic, not exotic, it's also like a critique on the self-exotization because we sell our identities. And in this part, I repeat my own makeup that I already did in Uzbekistan when I get married I, uh, in Uzbekistan. And then I did um, this year already, that was a painting, a monumental painting to me person too, uh, when I used this, um, all photo shootings that I also did in our national style. But uh, what I found interesting that we talk about national style or find this a national identity, but all these clothes, sometimes they were from China. And this fake, what we produce, and this image, what we produce, that's what I found now find very interesting in our in our capitalistic um relationships like to sell to sell identities to, to sell fake stuff and to play this expectation from us and we're like i mean not all we but people for example in central asia they in this is a colonial trap to because uh, when the tourists come in our lands they expect that a lot of people just dressing themselves every day like that <laughs> and that's what i think it's like for me when I when I meet a lot of people and talking about that and said yes you're just wearing this every day and I'm like yes yes I'm just I'm um ex how to say um I do it more visible more absurd more uh because I want to uh to play with these expectations and um to make them so crazy that uh, the people or uh, visitors or who expect it uh, or uh, they just uh, uh, losing themselves in this uh, this um like a fairy tale you know like that is a, that's an exotic trap and and um also what i also did i um had a long term relationship with uh, official intelligence from 2020 and I uh, that in the end came a book uh, it's um, called Great Game and now is uh, this uh, one exemplar book in Samarkand uh, where I talked about uh, Central Asia and uh, to find out what the 
official intelligence know about it and that, that was a lot of stereotypical stuff uh, and I'm trying to catch them and playing with them. It was, was very interesting. We translate these uh, dialogues on uh, all languages from Central Asia and in the end is uh, Pashto is um, in Afghanistan and um, on the, I think on the uh, from third or from fourth uh, language, uh, there was this word people, it was translated as a man. And how, I don't know if you know, we have some, uh, I would explain, uh, patriarchal problems. <laughs> and uh, so it was, I, I found it very interesting that the, the whole word people just, I mean, the, now this whole dialogue is about man and how the man relationship between. So, I mean, that's, that was also did by uh, official intelligence and I uh, found it very, um, this paradox, this uh, this error, like, you know, that's what I'm interested in to find it out. And um, here, this was my last work uh, also where I'm, just um, that's also the wall paint uh, wallpaper uh, where I'm using uh, social media because uh, social media also is a big part of my um, artistic praxis uh, where I'm trying to to make the filters as, as a, like, you know, we sell our identities, not uh, also as a central area people, also we sell ourselves on social media. So, um, and uh, that's, that's what I did to using a lot of, uh, um, fl filters and I was really surprised when I posted it that a lot of people wrote me oh my god you're so beautiful <laughs> and I'm like mm, okay I know because it was also my uh, it were also my friends because they saw that I did a, just a makeup or something like that and that's exactly what I really like I, li I like to play with this uh, expectations also from people and from also my followers sometimes and uh, to um to post something and to discuss and then you know like to make it not not completely fake but uh, this is what what uh, i think uh, maybe also um a way for people with specific background to go out you know like fake it <laughs> until you make it and uh, maybe uh, what i'm interested in to find a new way um, to talk about it and not every time to talk about background because i'm really i mean uh, because i'm doing this research around five years i'm a bit tired uh, to talk about it every time and what i want to do i want to think about future how we can survive uh, with all our problems and um and not talking about just uh, our um backgrounds because uh this past what already happened we cannot just change but what we can do we can take these mistakes i would say and to work on them and maybe to build a future where we can exist all together uh without um i mean that that was was for me very interesting. If we can do it, you know, like this is a huge question uh, for me. And uh, uh, if maybe social media that uh, also can help us to build a new identities and this fluid identity, like not just uh, based on on background, but also the opportunity to build a new or maybe also fake identity to survive. That's that's the point where I'm staying now and uh, where I'm working in. So yeah, it's a bit was a bit chaotic, but <laughs> yeah, if you have questions, I'm really happy to answer them. And uh, thank you again for inviting uh, for inviting and having me uh, on on this uh, very nice conference. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for showing um, us your work. Thank you so much. We really appreciate you being here. We're going to introduce um, the, our keynote speaker of the event. Um, We're passing it on to our wonderful professor, Sora. Um, we This event would not be possible without her. Um, We cannot hear you. Hi, can you all hear me? Okay, you know Hi, I'm behind Rona. the scenes because my hair is standing up. So um, I want to thank everyone. This has been such a brilliant conversation and I hope that we will continue it. Um, 
I want to introduce our keynote speaker, who's actually the main person um, who I think is connected to everyone <laughs> in this group. And I'm really um, excited about um, introducing her work. Uh, she's a brilliant um, art curator, brilliant person. I'm gonna read her, um, her bio mainly because there's so much wonderful things. Selby is a grassroots practitioner with over 20 years of civil society leadership and movement building expertise in Central Asia and the larger Eurasian neighborhood. She is also a cultural producer, collaborative curator and documentary artist. Selby is currently co-founding strategic director of the Central Asian feminist organization, Femagora, and collectively establishing the Central Asia Fund together with Leila Zuleha Mahmudov, Previously, she founded and co-coordinated Bishkek Feminist Collective uh, with uh, Galina Sokolova, co-created Unite Network in Kyrgyzstan with Umutai Dolateva in 2012, and, ad, uh, and advised founding and establishing of the 139 uh, Documentary Center in Uzbekistan. Uh, she directed strategy on environment and society at Artcom platform in Kazakhstan 2020 to 2022. Um, she is currently studying planetary boundaries as part of uh, her environmental science MS at IU, is it, I don't know which university is it? IU O'Neill School of Public and Environmental Affairs and continues to research human planetary, human mediated relationships with and in desert ecosystems and planetary scale entanglement as part of a research design project Dust in collaboration with Elisa Verbina. As an artist, Sel Selby is committed to collecting and curating her kinships, everyday narratives, memories, and artifacts in Turkmenistan. Her documentary work with Central Asian Quotidian pushes and pulls her throughout bazaar ecosystems, toy practices, and contemporary food and folk art across the region. Uh, Selby will be tying everything up and also really blessing us with her her um, magnanimous personality. Thank you, Selby. Thank you. I just, I'm so humbled uh, to be here with all of you and um, excited to see and hear so familiar faces and voices just before and meet new people. Um, I, um, I want to say that um, our organization, uh, Femogora Central Asia, is organization by and for Central Asia, in Central Asia. And actually around 15% of our um, extended community and uh, contributors are also diaspora. So it's Central Asian women, non-binary transgender people who are born um, geographically outside of um, Central Asia, but they do contribute. And maybe in some of our work, you will recognize uh, those artists, scholars, and Central Asian peoples, dwellers. So um, I um, I think this is an amazing um, and important conversations we're having today as we are also living the Central Asian futures. And um, all those futures and are already weaved into the visions that we are um, embodying in our reality, just like Anissa and Faina, Igrim. All the Igrims have shared. We had like uh, an I um, an Iganim. I want um, to quickly uh, talk about some of the. I, I want I want to talk about like three yeah looking for the link slides yeah I have I have a slides and um I pre I put them together while um listening to while listening to presentation uh, uh listening to everyone's experiences um and if you just go um I have supported and have co-created. <laughs> initiatives in Central Asia uh, since 2013. Um, and I say Central Asia because of uh, beyond just my immediate home of Ashgabat, 
uh, when I came to study in Kyrgyzstan in 2003, and I was 17 years old. Um, since then, I have crossed so many borders. I've been to so many um, localities, so many contacts in Central Asia. And if you go just back, I, I want to talk about this house a bit. This is a house of my... Um, if you go, yeah, sorry, it is a house, yeah. Um, Anika means uh, grandma in Kazakh. And that's the house of uh, Galina Sokolova, who is um, uh, Bishkek Tatar uh, in Kyrgyzstan, and my dear friend, my co-founder of this collective. It was called Bishkek. We wanted, we, we wanted to show that our collective is in the city where we are all dwelling. Some of us came as students, some are home free use, some are internal migrants. Um, you know, there is this concept of Jenny Konostal in Russian they call it Navastroikia as new developments. Konostal means neighborhoods. And there's people also from those neighborhoods who came. It was very um diverse, um very um engaged community of people who were making Bishkek reality happen and special feminist queer decolonial realities happening. Um at certain point, we became so visible that like our um, public interventions um, were in the newspapers as a top 10 interventions, public um, public actions in Central Asia. And then there were, um, we could manage to collectively change laws to support uh, women and girls and also, we have um, provided direct support to hundreds of communities across Bishkek and also worked in solidarity and only on, in solidarity with the communities that were not in Bishkek. And uh, there was a moment when we couldn't uh, find a place to live in and Gali's grandma passed away and her mom, who is also a craftsperson and also um seamstress and she came up to us and said why don't you come to Anika's house so uh, Gali also loves gardening we had a garden we had a library um, it's in the previous um, you can see that Gali is like drilling stuff like we were setting up our own like a board there and we'd come together we had solidarity dinners and all of this in the tradition of that courtyard you know the court grandma's courtyard in Central Asia I just wanted to show that because this is a continuity. Um, you know, it's, uh, and it's our own continuities. And also in the story, like when you think a Tatar and Bishkek, I think for many Central Asians here, it's like resonates. We know why, yeah, we know what was happening. So I just like uh, Faina, I don't want to just like give that background. Yeah, it was. Uh, so, and um, at the same time, if you go back, there is like this uh, teenage group. It's very self-organized, actually became top 20 girl-led groups in the world, got an award, and it was actually one of the only girl-led, not just for girls or with girls, but girl-led groups. And you see one of them, they're making stencils, and one of them is Manaschi. So those are not static things. I think that all of us here who will be speaking today, we are not static. Uh, we are not museum uh, artifacts or those exotic objects so complex, so dynamic and li alive. <laughs> and um, with a diaspora migrant uh, or dweller, with uh, transboundary dweller as my co-founder, Leila Mahmoudou, you will see her in, in my current organization. So I just wanted to show that like... Um, momentum that I captured. Actually, Delia here, she's now 24, 16 in this photo, is also my co-founding director at Femagora. And the arts are arts and spoken word and um, collective um, world making and co-creation and sharing food have uh, always been there and will be there. Yeah, it's and I want to share uh, next photo because it's uh, for those of you who are studying and engaging and working and co-creating the art. You know, Chingiz Aydarov. Chingiz Aydarov lives in that house right now. So if you ever visit him in his residence, Chingiz uh, has survived a stroke a couple of years ago. 
he was a labor migrant in Moscow and we've heard about uh, very challenging experiences of uh, Moscow uh, from many speakers, whether we've been there or not, it's very much governed our reality in a very reactionary way. And um, he's been a labor migrant there a while, a very precarious artist. And um, then he survived the trom thrombosis and came back home and then they had a stroke. And to, when many people have shared um, with all this uh, uh, Russian Russians who just uh, came all works, uh, uh, es escaping their realities and not co-creating them, but always finding <laughs> again the review <laughs> that um, I don't think they're refugees. I'm just meaning they're in my in their imagination and they're like, can we rent that house? And Galia's mom and Galia again to go back. It's like this house, uh, Chinggis should be living there because they're looking for a place for Chinggis to cope with stroke, to live, to recover, rehabilitate in some going process. And there's Marat Remkulov, maybe many of you know his art and 705 theater group. Um, we also collaborated a lot on masculinities and anti-patriarchal art together for many years, since 2008 with him. And he uh, currently taking care together with Chinggis and many other in the community. They live in that house. So if you ever visit, there is like already community run art workshop, a, a store where you can purchase stuff and so support and do uh, collaborate with Chinggis. Uh, that's his home and residence today and that's Anika's house so just wanted to share that uh, beauty and I know that many of the people who have uh, presented if Timur would be here today and, and you have have worked and been uh, with uh, Chinggis and perhaps visited that place so uh, I suggest you to follow him and support many artists often co-create art and sell to support Chinggis so you uh, swallow so the next one, next slide, I want to talk about a little bit about my um, Femagora Central Asia start as a festival initiated by Lila Mahmudova. She is a transboundary dweller. Her family lives all across from Tashkent to Shrimkent and mom is from Suzak and dad is ancestral home is in Karabakh. So she initiated this uh, festival. And um, if you go further, it was a place for hundreds of grassroots people, artists, journalists, researchers, scholars, educators um, come together and share their experiences, insights, so dense, so engaged, so meaningful. Uh, most of them actually on our YouTube channel, so you can go and look. Sometimes people say, oh, there is no expert on such and such in Central Asia, and they bring in a consultant, <laughs> or they bring in a um, not a woman, not a queer transgender person. And actually, if you go to our uh, festival program list, and if you look up the uh, YouTube videos, over, you'll see that everyone is there. And actually, that's where she also, together with Modiar, Ilki Bekov, started uh, film festivals. And actually, Anissa's films were screened there too. So if you go further, um, and I uh, getting mentioned... Um, so we have this uh, festival and we can go next page, the photo to to see some of the photos from the first X. So you see there's like so many people you can recognize. There is Dilda, there is uh, Ramazan, there is uh, Yekaterin, uh, like, uh, there is Katya Suvorova who films like you know too. There is uh, Sulia Sulimenova and her daughter, um, so in BK is here, so everyone been gathering together, speaking across disciplines, across practices, different causes, um, not only commonalities, but also differences. For us at Fimagor, it's so important to build that solidarity, not across differences only, but also in dissensus. We don't have to be together, to, to agree to be together. Yeah. Um, in that our own complex Central Asia. So um, we'll go next uh, slide. And I think uh, actually Saulia's mom was mentioned today, um, Saida Ilmanova, who is a scholar of uh, Kazakh and Central Asian music. I um, I actually shared here, it's, um, sorry that you, I'm, I'm going to give you 
I'm gonna give you permission. Uh, I was I'm surprised that it cannot be played. Just a sec. Um, why I wanna share is because we we actually uh, we produce lots of post festival and during festival uh publications multimedia ones too. Uh, if you go to our uh, website, you'll see uh, actually our website and the reconstruction right now, so you can play that. I I made that screen screenshot screen. Uh, screen video of our one of our stories on Instagram because we also had a poetry collection published in 2020. Um, this poetry collection of Central Asian poets, women poets from um, uh, different Central Asian uh, countries and they were was a reading their own work already in someone else's in the language of their feelings and uh, preference at this moment. Uh, so uh, it will be back on in the beginning of next year. We're currently re uh, redeveloping our website. So you'll be able to hear so those of you who do not speak Russian, but the Turkic speaking or um, Farsi speaking person, you can uh, hear uh, Tajik poet reading in Tajik, for example, and uh, Turkmen Uzbek reading in Turkmen, there's uh, Kazakh on, in that collection. Um, the next slide. I just want to, I added in so we know that there's uh, places that, um, and we started doing some online and actually in 2020, we had 5,000 unique <laughs> um, visitors. But in 2021, we had over 100 co-producers of the festival. And you can see there's, uh, I got name what uh, I she hasn't mentioned, but she's one of the uh, most prominent meme artists and meme scholars of Central Asia. Um, and she had a workshop and a lecture um, um, organized in our uh, virtual space. We had this proximity um, chat based uh, of space where uh, there was toy, there were yurts, and those of you who uh, follow Babalar Press or the yurt, Aydi Sahan Kaze was the main digital architect of the space together with uh, Camille. So there's many people who have been engaged. Uh, some of them I mentioned here. Um, and uh, uh, I'm sharing this so you know that there's also opportunity to engage with us next year because we are uh, planning to have this grandiose uh, festival. So, and we at certain point we realize we want to have conversations with each other, not uh, in a talk like today, but in a talk where we turn to each other and can share what it's like to be a grassroots organizer, artist, producer, co-creator, what it's like to embody our communities and our context uh, realities and also future visions of future. So we started organizing those community forums. And one of them, um, at first, on the surface, seemed to be so formal, uh, but at the same time, so intimate, because we had people from Afghanistan join us. Uh, I've been part of some of uh, advisory groups for intergovernmental organizations, you know, very rigid, very um, bureaucratic. Not, not a space where we're welcomed, we're often inconvenient, but very needed as they govern our developmentalist reality. And I specifically want to be, regardless of all odds and discomfort, I want to be in the places where I can connect to larger Central Asia. And um, I've been part of the Spotlight Advisory Group together with uh, Afghan colleagues in Afghanistan. And... Um, even though it was after uh, like um, August 2022 and um, still our Afghan colleagues could join us, we could uh, organize um, using uh, govern uh, people who cared in the government on a local, regional and transparency level to bring everyone in. It was uh, a precious uh, moment and a uh, space to share with everyone because usually I don't know if so many people like from Soviet, post-Soviet, so-called post-Soviet Central Asia know that usually it's like three republics or four and not in its um, multiplicity and not in its diversity. So for us, it was important to like 
expand dependent on this. So, um, and um, I don't know why uh, we can offer the, like you can just skip because it's time and I'm gonna, I, I wanna skip and um, if anyone wants to hear more, you can visit our website, please follow us on Instagram and uh, because it's an organization for all of us, including gender aware men gender alert and feminist trans for feminist transformative <laughs> visions and um you've noticed i use the word expert it's a very um problematic word and for a long time i've been in the movements for more than 20 years and people rarely not only women but also men central asian men use the word of expert about ourselves and we decided to reclaim it so as you see in um if you go uh, back there is i uh, we conceptualize expertise as uh, informed by our lived experiences um i'm going to be facetious right now uh, because we have lots of um diaspora i think central asian students also in the room and there is this um thing that uh non-central asian person comes just to learn a language to hang out or to have an internship in our home and in a couple of years, you'll see them as an international consultant or worker in a, <laughs> in, a, in a, and you're still out there on the street or in your Anika's house, if you're lucky. <laughs> I mean, not lucky, like you, you have a community. And, you know, you're still there as in this hierarchy, even as a grassroots scholar practitioner. So we decided to reclaim that. And everyone here online in a hybrid in New York, uh, from across the world, no, you are worthy and you are an expert of your community, of your context, of your reality and of your future visions in this diversity. And um, and I wanna here show Camila Zahida was our co-founding visual strategy director. She's also co-founding creative and art director of uh, 139 Documentary Center, uh, where Timur is one of the speakers, the founder today. Uh, so when she came in, she was like, why purple? <laughs> yeah, so we, um, with appreciation for transnational feminisms, uh, we, uh, we don't have purple anymore. And why it's green? Because we realized in a very simple thing as like Word document, our names, names for our places, for our homes, for our realities, and even the way how we spell out and articulate our futures were always in red as if it's wrong, it has to be corrected, or it has to be added to this uh, Western-centric software in its vocabulary, so it's not ignored, so it's not neglected, and it's legitimate. And um, she's like, we're going to, in Femagora, we want it to be in green. So it's, because uh, our organization is for grassroots by grassroots, so please uh, join. And I hope that we're going to collaborate and hold such a diaspora and grassroots, Central Asian diaspora grassroots convening in the near future, in a hybrid across from New York, perhaps to Shrimkian, because this is where we're mostly based now. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. We're very excited. I'm going to pass this on to our comedy humor. Thank you. Uh, please follow FM Agora, and uh, we'll have all the links available on the website. I'm going to pass this on to Angel, Angel and Finn. There we go. So uh, we'll be introducing Natan Badalov, uh, who is a Bakarian writer and comedian from Queens. His work has been featured uh, in Adult Swim and numerous film festivals, including the... Yeah, you know, including the recent New York Comedy Festival, where his show, Connect the Dots, has been showcased. Yeah. Uh, welcome, Natan. Hey, you're not in the thing. I know. <laughs> Come in. There we go. All there right. Go. What's up? Is everybody, everybody's here now. Yeah. Yeah, everybody's here. Are the people watching? And we've got some guests on. Yeah, we've got some guests on. Oh. So, doing? yeah, thank you so much for being here. Yeah, and thanks. I want to give you like a little time maybe to just give a brief introduction of yourself. My name is Natan. And what did you say about me? <laughs> I'm a Bukharian comedian and writer. Uh, I was born in Uzbekistan. I left when I was one and a half. Um, I'm a true American. That's it. That's all I got. 
Awesome. Uh, so you grew up in uh, Jackson Heights. I yeah, yeah, yeah. To some other interviews. Uh, what was that sort of like for you? It's the most, I think it's the most diverse place per capita. I yeah. don't know if it's in America, but it's definitely in New York. I think it might be the world. The world? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it was very, I didn't feel out of place in any way because everybody I knew was from somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Like I would play soccer and there would be people from Bangladesh, Colombia, yeah. Ecuador and stuff like that. And I would just, because I look ethnically ambiguous, people wouldn't even, right. I could just make it up. Mm -hmm. yeah. Was there a significant uh, Bukharian community no. where you grew up? Not no. really? No, they're mostly in like Regal Park and mm -hmm. Forest Hills and um, yeah, it's mostly there. But in Jackson Heights, there's not that many. Uh, that's me. But uh, in your youth, did you find yourself and your family like visiting Rigo Park a lot to yeah. sort of yeah, 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 yeah. be in that community? Yeah, yeah. Ooh. I went to Forest Hills High School. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So eventually I, I regrouped with my people. Sure. Nice. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so what initially drew you to comedy? Like, how did you figure that this was something you were going to do like as a career? Or did you have no clue about that? <laughs> no, I mean... As a career, I mean, I actually went to Hunter. I don't know if you, I got rejected from Macaulay. Uh, well, <laughs> well, you made it now. You made right? it yeah. now. <laughs> Who rejected my application? Uh, what are you saying? Oh, uh, why? What did I do? Yeah. Um, I, I guess, I don't know, trauma, I guess. <laughs> That's the one thing, trying to overcome that. And then, you know, you go to, when I went to Hunter, I dormed in Brookdale. And uh, it's on like 25th and 1st, right? And then there's New York Comedy Club, like on 24th and 3rd. And I remember there was a girl I was dating at the time. And every time we would walk to the 6th train, right? But I would, on purpose, always try to go through 24th and 3rd. Uh, and I would just, like, look at it. And she would probably think I was, like, some autism. I had autism. <laughs> like, why does he keep going through this block? Because I could go just through 23rd. But, and I didn't acknowledge it. Like, why do I keep looking at this thing? But then after a while, like, you know, I mean, you're probably doing this. Like, what do I want to do with my life? Uh, maybe some of you already know what you want to do with your lives, but I didn't. And um, once you start asking yourself these questions, then you're like, all right, what do I not want to be? And I look at all the depressed people and I go, I don't want to look like that. Right. Yeah. yeah. And and at Hunter, you were studying English. English. Okay. Don't do it. That's a bad thing. I'm too late. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, don't do it. Yeah. No, I'm just kidding. No, no. I'm sure um, it taught me something subconsciously. I, I don't know what it taught me. I, I think it, as a skill, it's probably pretty applicable in, in the comedy world. Yeah. There's so many English majors. Yeah, well. Right. <laughs> comedy. We'll be seeing you soon, probably. Yes, yes. Uh, I look forward to it, yeah. I, I want to ask, uh, in terms of, it's common for comedians to sort of... It, it seems common to sort of have to break the news to your family like oh i i'd like to i think try oh i um, never did that no I, held, I hid it from my mom uh for like a year i would just say i'm going to see sh comedy shows right and then after a year she's like are you doing this mm -hmm. and I go, yeah yeah and then she goes she was upset that i didn't tell her sooner because mm. to her it was like i was withholding something from mm, sure. my life yeah. And I felt she felt that or I felt that she would be kind of ashamed of it in some mm -hmm. way. I didn't know how she would react, but she didn't. She was she was down. Yeah. Now she's upset. I don't talk about her more on stage. Right. <laughs> oh, right. So why don't you talk about me? It's not about I can't keep talking about you. <laughs> you're not all. You're not... <laughs> yeah. So, and, and, and maybe a reaction from your father. Well, I got a single mom. So, oh really? Am okay. Go. Yeah, it's the trauma. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah. So I didn't have to break the news to him. Yeah, lucky you. Yeah, yeah. Thankfully, yeah. he left. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um. Yeah. So, when it comes to your uh, like comedy, it when you know it's sort of a it's a nothing question to ask a comedian yeah. like where do you get your ideas? Trauma. Trauma. Yeah. Okay. And do you think right? But do you think uh? Is it, your identity is at the foremost uh, or the forefront in your mind when you're coming up with stuff no it it wasn't for a while and then when i wrote this show the connect the dots that had a lot to do with 
my Bukharian identity and being Jewish and stuff like that. Yeah. Cause it would always come up in some ways. And um, I felt like I would, I would kind of just be suppressing something in my life that was actually a big part of it. Yeah. I didn't feel like that was fair, but I also don't think it's a good idea. This is for me. I don't think it's a good idea to just identify with that part of your life as an artist. Nobody is just their identity. You're, Multiple you're, facets. There's so many things. Yeah. You know, it's part of me. And it, it does influence me a lot. But construction. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it's part of me. But it's not all of me. That show is is a lot has a lot to do with it. But the next one, I don't think will be. It's something that I just needed to kind of. You said like it, you maybe it felt like there was some suppression going on. So yeah. it's as you become probably more successful and more comfortable in your skin creatively, and uh, yeah, well, yeah, get a load of this. Uh, <laughs> you you think it's been able to come out a lot more, and you're more comfortable sharing that part of yourself in your. Company. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not like I was ashamed of being Bukharian or from right. Uzbekistan. I just I would see other comedians that would just talk about one thing yeah and that just you just become pigeonholed in that way where like and eventually like i i just don't feel like it makes you better as a comedian if you just keep talking to the same people yeah you know you got to kind of make your you got to explain yourself to everybody if that's yeah. that's the best way to do it like if you can make your ideas just everyone can somehow take something from it that's the best thing yeah but I don't know if that answered your question. No, no, I okay. think it did well too. Um, and and like be, before coming to this class, I think uh, you know I I didn't know about the existence of Bukharian Jews, right? It's messed up. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, but you know now I'm learning more. I'm glad to have you here. But when you go to other parts of the country, if you're on the road ever, oh my god, do, do you do you even like bother bringing it up? They think I. They if I say Allahu Akbar, they'll be like he's Muslim. Yeah, right. They, they don't. They don't sure. know anything. No. Yeah, can't tell the difference. Midwest, no. <laughs> no. They think I'm Hispanic. They think I'm all this stuff. But yeah. it's not like a slight on them. It's just your product yeah. of your surroundings. If yeah, you, yeah. You never came across. Sometimes there's only like some towns I've been in, and they don't even have Jews there. So it's yeah. like. I'm Jewish and then I'm a Bukharian Jew and then I gotta like you gotta kind of explain all that. But yeah, I don't get mad at them or anything sure. like that. Yeah. No, no. So speaking of your show, uh Connect the Dots, what was sort of the experience drafting and preparing it for the film festival? The I had uh material about and I think there's a common immigrant experience, but uh my mom pressuring me to get married to a Jew, right? And I don't I didn't know why I had apprehension towards that. So then I started started to analyze it. And then just things kept happening in my life where like uh I don't know, I guess I'll give you the layout of the, the show. Yeah. My mom would pressure me to marry a Jew, but I can't because I'm a Bukharian Jew and I have a lot of like like identity issues and stuff like that. So I had a lot of resentment towards uh, American Jews and Ashkenaz Jews because a lot of them kind of felt like they didn't accept me when I was a kid and all that stuff so I led to a lot of resentment with them and it came out in different ways I dated a rabbi for a few years because mm -hmm. I felt like that would kind of overcome yeah. that and guess what it didn't it didn't, <laughs> it didn't overcome that at all because then if you date a rabbi you know they want to do you know, Jew stuff, rabbi yeah. stuff, you know, you gotta be super that's a super Jew right there, right? <laughs> and I'm I'm looking I'm I'm this, you know. Yeah. I was content yeah. with not being that Jewish. So um because of that it didn't work out. And then uh, you know, I felt like I had to just ex have more acceptance, yeah, as, you know, internally, you know, True. therapy. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. And was that the first big show you've ever kind of done? Because I know you've done like smaller stand-ups. Oh, but... yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, it was the first solo show I ever wrote. Um, it sounds a lot like like trauma and all this other stuff, but it's a stand-up show. It's, mm -hmm. not, yeah. it's not like I'm crying on stage or anything like that. That's fine yeah. if you do that. That's fine. Yeah. It's, there's artistic merit to that, but I, I, I don't do that. Yeah. 
Um, and what was sort of like the reception to it? I had wanted to go because I saw oh, it, yeah, it was yeah. very recent, yeah, but yeah. unfortunately, it's okay. But yeah, it's okay. um, what was sort of like the reception to it? Was it like anything you expected, or there are a lot of Bukharian Jews that I've never met before that that was good. I I like knowing that they liked it in particular. I don't ever want to. I don't like that thing where like you gotta put your own people down in order for other people to kind of accept you. Yeah, I don't like doing that. So I I wanted to make sure they. I asked them, did you like it? Did you enjoy it? So you know, that's why I kind of don't like. Uh, I don't know. I guess that's just a pet peeve of mine. Like yeah, people that's bring in their own. Like, yeah, you know, people do that enough. You know, bring others. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, yeah. Uh you have any further? Well, you know, I, I mean, if you can talk a little bit more about uh, the difference, particularly in, in your, like, in the comedy uh, mm. profession yeah. of, uh, instead of, like, broadening to, like, a national point of view, but, yeah. like, uh, in particular in New York, um, you know, there are a lot of, like, young Jewish American people doing yeah, comedy. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, if growing up you kind of felt alienated a little bit how yeah. is that manifested now i'm sure it's a lot different um, or if anything non-existent would it say the last part again it, i'm sure like growing up kids can be bad you know yeah. and maybe <laughs> and but now uh, you know you're an adult and people yeah. are much more accepting particularly yeah. in this part of the, the country yeah, 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 but yeah. uh it, you know has anything funny happened when, or, or maybe uh with american with ashkenaz yeah. american jews i mean I mean, I, I remember talking shit about matzo ball soup and saying how I saw that. Disgusting I saw that. <laughs> and I, I've never gotten more hate. On that. It was so funny. It, it but it's so probably fun. the truest thing you've ever said. <laughs> yeah, I didn't. I guess they really like matzo ball soup. Yeah. And they're wrong. It's yeah. really bad. Mm -hmm. They should know that. Yeah. That's my stance. That's <laughs> my It's stand. a good thing. Yeah. Eat but their it, own butt. Yeah. I mean, in terms of anything funny happening, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's always just cultural differences. Sure. Where, yeah. So what's sort of like next for you now? I know you mentioned that you wanted to do another sort of show. Yeah, you, do you, are you like coming up with ideas yeah, already? Yeah, or? Yeah, yeah, I think it's it's not ready because it's so soon. But yeah, yeah, just working on a new one. Trying to go take connected dots around to around America um, and also writing a new one. Yeah, that's that's pretty much it. Yeah, going to Macaulay. Yeah, yeah, we're happy to have you anytime. Yeah, yeah, yeah. thanks. Yeah, thanks for having me. Well, thank you so much yeah, for yeah. coming out. Like, we really, really appreciate. It. Were there any? Was anybody writing in this? Like the comments and stuff. That's a great hey, question. Let's see. <laughs> Let me see if any. Yeah, maybe we can throw it to any audience members. A beautiful. I was just about. Oh, that was that was from before. Yeah, that was from before. They all Those tuned out. Like, oh, <laughs> or if anybody in the room has any. Yeah, if anybody in the room's got questions, you should put the camera to them. No, it's okay if you don't have any questions. <laughs> yeah, you're all ready to go. That's fair. Were you guys? What? Sorry. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Hey, you guys are ready to go, right? How long have you guys been here? since like 12 <laughs> yeah 12 a couple hours. A little early. wow it's time yeah yeah you gotta go thank all you. right we'll put the links up thank you so much yeah sure. thanks for having me thank you thank you thank you thank you thank you hi we are ready for our final our closing our most beautiful Holly John. <laughs> um, do, who, do you want to read? Well, Holly John, I actually met when she was part of the, the must and performing and I was on watching her on stage and I was absolutely smitten and I'm so grateful for your friendship and for your depth, for the way you've taken Jalaluddin Rumi, Maulana as we call him, and turned it into music and poetry. So we're just going to shift over to the next room and we'll we'll start uh, so you can go ahead and we'll just start really moving from here okay go ahead one two three let's go run <laughs> we're just running to the next room all right um do you need me to project anything okay hi <laughs> <laughs>
All right, do you, uh, do you want to introduce her? Colin? Okay. Sorry. Hi, thank you so much for coming. I'm just going to let them uh, commute, settle down for a second before introducing you. Okay. Um, sorry about that. Again, thank you so much. Um, our next panelist is Hale Lisa Gafori, who is a translator, vocalist, poet, and educator born in New York City of Iranian and Persian descent. Her book, Gold, Translations of Poems by Rumi, was released in 2022. Gold was chosen as a favorite book of 2022 by Maria Popova at the Margin Marginalanian and declared one of those books bound to go on nourishing generations to come. So thank you so much for joining us. If you want to talk a bit about your work, that'd be so great. Sure. Um, thanks for having me. I'm happy to be here. And um, yeah, I've been uh, translating Molana Rumi's po poetry. Uh, pretty much I started in 2016. I've been hearing his poetry since I was a child and he spirals through my life. You know, I heard my father reciting him in Persian. I'm going to share a little Persian because a lot of people don't realize how incredibly rhythmic the poetry is. He was at times um, spontaneously composing to the beat of a drum. So here's a little bit. Yar mara qar mara ishq jigar khar mara yar toi qar toi khaj nagah dar mara. Nuh toi ruh toi fatev o maftuh toi sine mashruh toi bardar asrar mara. Nur toy, sur toy, dol at a man sur toy, morge cohe tur toy, haste bemengar mara. Gatre toy, bar toy, lot toy, gar toy, gan toy, zar toy, beesh mayazar mara, hojre a horshe toy, hane a nahi toy, rosea omi toy, raw de yar mara, ruse toy, ruse a toy, hassle a dar use a toy, ob toy, kuse a toy, ob dehim bar mara, don a toy, dom toy, bod a toy, jam toy, pocht a toy, ham toy, ham be magzar mara. So you see, you're laughing. One of you is kind of laughing. Um, it's it's extraordinary. You can laugh. What makes you laugh? I'm curious. <laughs> Wait, no, 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 not at all. We're doing the poetry. It's um, it's something that popped up on a lot of screen. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah. No, it's okay. I don't mind. I, I think laughter is very important. Laughter is a very important part of Rumi's poetry too. Sufi mysticism, this philosophy, if it doesn't bring us to relaxation and laughter, it's not really accomplishing its work. You know, this is a this is a poetry of liberation and a poetry of wellness for human beings. And it's a very important philosophy, I think, especially in these times. Um, the reason I started translating him was his poetry is because I love it, because I think it's aesthetically amazing, but but also because I think the messages are very, very valuable. And, you know, we have the, the um, hi there people, we, <laughs> we have this amazing rhythm and rhyme and also these profound messages that sort of defy borders, you know, linguistically and can still be transmitted even though you don't necessarily have the music of Persian in English, but you can transmit these messages that I think are very valuable. I think they dialogue with, you know, a culture that's been obsessed with materialism and individualism. And this poetry presents mysticism and even animism. And by animism, I mean the awareness that everything is alive. You know, when he says, soft white stars of jasmine, sweet dizzying musk of jasmine, where is your garden? I'll serve at the gate. A flower steps out of its tight bud, gives its nectar, gives its gold. How do we do the same? Dear Nightingale, I bow to your bright songs, never the same twice. Master of improvisation, perched in a tree. Flowers delight you, you delight us. How do we pass on the favor? You know, so 
Rumi's world is alive with reverence and praise for the flowers, for the birds, for existence, for the water. And in fact, you know, love he, he talks of as a form of water, ah behayat. He says, let love the water of life flow through our veins. And why is this love, ah behayat, water of life? Because what, ground, what will water the space inside of us to ensure that battlefields do not proliferate and gardens proliferate within us, but love? What is the water but love? Compassion. What is the water but compassion? What will, what, what will make uh, the space between us turn from battlefields to gardens? Compassion. Compassion. So this is a very, very profound philosophy. And I don't, the underpinnings of our modern world, clearly, you know, it's, one could say materialism, individualism, profitism, you know, the, the putting profit above everything, that is not what the Sufis are doing. They're putting the force of love and the force of transformation within the human being above everything. And they invite us, he says, child of flesh and bone, you are a child of soul. What is your mission here but to love? Why are you busying yourself with all these other tasks? <laughs> you know, and of course, there's many ways to define this action of loving. You know, it's not one way of doing it. But this invitation to cultivate love, Shams of Tabriz, Rumi, Molana Rumi's teacher, his guide, his friend, his beloved, said to him, the secret wisdom is this. Are you ready for the secret wisdom from Shams of Tabriz? <laughs> he said, the secret wisdom is this. The sea of compassion wants to rise within you. So what if this was a sort of thought that pervaded cultures? That there's actually a love within you, a primordial love that you're actually made of this love, that this sea of compassion is part of you and wants to be expressed. It wants to rise within you. It's a nice thought. So, so, so a lot of these poems, you know, I, I, I've been just giving a line here, a line there. He says, for instance, love unclenches the body or love opens the clenched body. Love opens the clenched body, lets the soul breathe. So this book, Gold, um, was released last year, and these are the translations that I worked on for um, many years. I'll share with you the very first poem that I translated, which is the penultimate poem in the book. I'll share just a part of it. I'll share little pieces, because I think we have, we have till what time, till 3.30, or we have a little more than 3.30? We have till 3.30. Yeah. yeah 3 .30. So here, here's, the, here's the penultimate poem in the book and the very first one I translated, I'll share a piece of it. And I, I'm sharing this because I want to show also how he engages with mortality and death. He invites us also to recognize that we are both mortal, these bodies are mortal, and perhaps, you know, he believes immortal. Like he says in one poem, like love, I will live on radiant and eternal when this eating and sleeping is done. Till then, till then, like Bubak, the master musician, I quiet my mind and listen. So this idea of deep listening was very important to him. What is he listening to? He's listening to music. He's listening to silence. He's trying to quiet even the vast vas, which is the spinning chatter inside the mind. And also he's confronting his own fear. He says, why should I be afraid? I'm the one who gives form to formless fear. Now, there's a lot of reasons to be afraid. Uh, humans are, do, are doing a mess. Um, there's no doubt about it that, that, that there is so much trauma on this earth and has been. And so he's not denying that for a moment, but he's also saying, can we try not to manufacture incriminating narratives, self-loathing narratives, other loathing narratives, fear-based narratives, because these become self-fulfilling prophecies, you know? So... Let's see his celebratory poem about death. <laughs> if wheat sprouts from my grave, and if you bake bread from it, expect to get drunk. 
The baker and the dough will lose their minds. The oven will rattle off ecstatic verse. If you make a pilgrimage to my grave and stand on my burial mound, expect to dance. Don't come to my grave without a drum, my friend. A feast with God is no place for sadness. Asleep in my grave, my mouth sewn shut, I am chewing the beloved sweet opium. So I'll leave it right there. That's not the entire poem, but just to say a radical view too of even the sad experience of death, right? And the scary experience of death. But he, but Sufi mysticism is a, a psychologically supportive, it supports the human psyche. It says, I know you're afraid of death. I know you're afraid of each other. I know you forget easily. We forget easily that we are interconnected and we are actually on one level, one. We forget, we forget, and then we forget again. And so this philosophy is a reminder. You are me and I am you. Why get mired in all these me's and you's? We are light upon light and the light glass passes through. Why muddy ourselves with a grudge? One essence, one intelligence thrust us into one curved cosmos where the mind sees two, counts two, the soul, I'm sorry, where, where the soul counts one, the mind sees two, right? And he'll say, why tear the hole in two? Your eyes are not a vulture's beak. See with the beloved's eyes. See with the beloved's eyes. See one when, you're, when your mind says two. We'll leave it there. Thank you so much. That was great. That was beautiful. Thank you. Um, and again, thank you to all of our panelists. Thank you so much for joining. Um, thank you to everybody for coming. Yeah, thank you to Zora um, for helping us organize everything. There she is. Um, I don't know if she wants to say any last remarks or maybe not. No, no. Okay, well, two two fingers for yes, one finger. Oh, she's <laughs> no, she's, she's going. Coming. Oh no, she's not. Oh. Okay, well, all right. I wasn't sure what was happening. Oh, go ahead. Is wait, I want to say hi. Is Le if Laylee Long Soldier is here, hi. <laughs> I see your name. I like your work. <laughs> we are all honored. Thank you for this incredible panel. Thank you, everyone. Come on, say hello and goodbye. Thank you for the reading. Thank you for the intellectual work, the sense of community. Thank you all for all of this beautiful day. And thank you to my students for being so wonderful and organized and awesome. So uh, thank you so much. God bless, take care.